Honorable members, the prayer. Lord, the God of righteousness and truth, grant to our queen and to our government, to members of the legislative assembly and to all in positions of responsibility, the guidance of your spirit. May they never lead the province wrongly through love of power or desire to please or unworthy ideas, but laying aside all private interest and prejudice, keep in mind their responsibility to seek to improve the condition of all. Honourable members, please remain standing as we pay tribute to a former member who recently passed away. Today I'd like to welcome uh, members of the Lund family and their friends to the gallery, the speaker's gallery. Ty Lund served six terms in the Legislative Assembly of Alberta as a Progressive Conservative member for Rocky Mountain House from 1989 to 2012. During his tenure, he was the Minister of Environmental Protection, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Development, the Minister of Infrastructure, the Minister of Government Services, and the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Before turning to provincial politics, Mr. Lund was a farmer, then a councillor and the Reeve of the Municipal District of Clearwater. He was awarded the Queen's, Queen Elizabeth Jubilee Award in 2002. Mr. Lund spoke of how proud he was of taking part in, quote, in managing the affairs of the province and working for the best interest of Albertans. Ty Lund passed away on February 28, 2021 at the age of 82. In a moment of silent prayer, I ask you to remember Mr. Lund each as you may have known him. Rest eternal, grant unto him, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon him. Members, we will now be led in the singing of our national anthem, by Ms. Brooklyn Allard, please refrain from joining her. Please be seated. Introduction of visitors. Honorable members, it is with our greatest admiration and respect. You know, there is a gratitude to members of the families who share the burdens of public service. And today, I'd like to welcome them, those family members, to the Speaker's Gallery of members of the Lund family who are present here. As I call your name, please remain standing until all members have been introduced. Mr. Lund's brother, Mark Lund, and his wife, Wendy, and their daughters, Mr. Lund's nieces, Hannah, Taylor, and Clara, and Hannah's partner, Conrad David. Mr. Lund's sister, Charlene Van Holen, and his niece, Marcine Olson, and close family friends, Ashton Bueller, Robert DeWerker, Fran DeWerker, and Rose McComb. Honorable members, please help me welcome and thank 
these family members of Mr. Tai Lung. We also have, please feel free to be seated. We also have uh, one other very special guest today joining us in the speaker's gallery. Speaking of gratitude that uh, we all owe to family members, perhaps the people who bear the burden the most are our children and Minister of Health, his son, Archie Shandro, has joined us today. Welcome, Archie. <laughs> Introduction of guests, ministerial statements. The Honourable, the Government House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a great opportunity to rise today to pay tribute to a former MLA from Rocky Mountain House, as well as a former Environment Minister, Mr. Tyrone Lunn, or Ty. I want to start first off, Mr. Speaker, by acknowledging, as you have, uh, that the presence of Ty's family uh, in the chamber with us today and say through you, Mr. Speaker, to them, on behalf of, I think, all members of the chamber, welcome to Alberta's legislature, and thank you for sharing Ty with us all those years. As you noted, Mr. Speaker, Ty passed away on February 28th of this year at 82 years of age. Ty represented a constituency in an area of the province that both you and I call home and have the privilege of representing inside the 30th legislature. Several significant great politicians have represented this area. Alfred Hook, who is the longest serving MLA in the history of our province uh, and saw central Alberta through the Great Depression. In fact, he and former MLA Lund together represented my constituency for 15 of the 30th legislatures that our province has had since Confederation. One of our true giants, central Alberta, the late great Bob Clark, your friend and mentor who represented part of my constituency as well. And of course, my dear friend, the late great Myron Thompson, who is one of my great mentors. And Mr. Speaker, Ty's mentor and one of the great politicians that came from Rocky Mountain House, Helen Hunley, who was the first female cabinet minister of a full line portfolio inside our province, Mr. Speaker, and the first lieutenant governor of this province. Female lieutenant governor, I should say, Mr. Speaker. I mention these names not to brag about the best that Central Alberta has sent to this chamber, though we have sent some of the great giants, but to say that Ty can and should be mentioned in the light of some of the true champions of our region in the same class as the greatest to have represented us both here in Edmonton and in Ottawa. Ty was born in Rocky Mountain House in 1938 and called Clearwater County his home for his entire life. He would go on to serve as the MLA for his home constituency for six terms, from 1989 to 2012, a total of 8,435 days in provincial office. Mr. Speaker, that's over 23 years of service in this assembly and service to his constituents. That was on top of almost a decade of service as municipal leader before he ran for MLA, first as a councillor and then a reeve for the MD of Clearwater. He also served on various community organizations like the Kinsman Club and the Rotary Club. And Mr. Speaker, he was a man of deep and abiding faith and was active in his church community. During his time in government, Ty was often referred to as Premier Ralph Klein's Minister of Everything. During his lengthy political career, Ty served as Minister of Environmental Protection, Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Food and Rural Development, Minister of Infrastructure, Minister of Transportation, and Minister of Government Services. Ty will be remembered by many current and former members of this assembly as an adept and talented politician, which he certainly was, Mr. Speaker. In fact, in the last leadership race for the Premier inside this province, I called Ty for some help with selling memberships. And sure enough, he showed up a week later with over 200 memberships from retirement, Mr. Speaker. Ty always still had it. His talents in this assembly and in the broader political arena were more a result of pragmatism rather than partisanship. He could be opinionated, to be sure, and those in the gallery know that. But ideology wasn't what guided Ty. He was guided by his values, hard work, honesty, and fairness. In Ty's maiden speech in this very building, in this very chamber, in June of 1989, he expressed his reason for entering provincial politics and his understanding of the fun fundamental role of government. And he said, and I quote, My decision to enter provincial politics grew out of the desire to serve the public on a broader scale. I felt the need to promote some convictions which I hold very strongly, convictions about the role a government should play in the lives of people. 
He would go on to say, you will see that I don't believe government can or should do all things for all people all the time. Rather, it is a facilitator. I believe the role of government is to keep the law and order in the land and to provide essential services like education, health care, transportation, and to direct its activities to meet the goals of its citizens. Our duty is to make sure that everyone is treated fairly under the law, to safeguard their freedom, to carry out the will of the majority while protecting the rights of the minority. I think that description sums up Ty's views on politics very well, Mr. Speaker. Straightforward, to the point, and no nonsense. He certainly loved his political life, but much more than that, Ty loved to farm. In his same maiden speech in June of 1989, Ty spoke of his deep rural roots in Clearwater County. And he said, I am a third generation farmer. My grandfather, my father, and myself clear land, some of it by hand. I'm proud of the fact that the land title on my home quarter has only had the name Lund on it. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, Ty would go on to serve for many years as Alberta's environment minister. And in this role, he came to, it was a role he came to, Mr. Speaker, honestly. Because you see, Ty believed deeply in the role of farmers and ranchers played in conservation of our land, air, and water. He said, the farm family is an indispensable part of Alberta society. The farming community is environmentally conscious. As stewards of the land, farmers are serious about protecting the land because it is their future. We take our roles in preserving the environment very seriously. Ty was always a strong advocate for the environment and for rural Alberta and the agriculture industry. And he shared his love of agriculture and young people volunteering with local 4-H clubs. He gave back so much, always with an eye to the future, building a better Alberta for generations to come. But I want to stress, Mr. Speaker, Ty was always first and foremost a farmer. His first chief of staff likes to tell a story when he was agriculture minister, Mr. Speaker, coming back from a trade mission to Russia. And he's got a green diplomatic passport and Russian security has given him a hard time getting on the airplane, Mr. Speaker, because they want to understand how he got the passport. And his chief of staff is trying to tell him that he's a minister of agriculture in Canada. And the security won't let uh, the chief answer the question. And Ty keeps telling the security guards, I'm a farmer from Rocky Mountain House. All he had to say was that he was a minister and he would have got through, but he's, that is who he was first and foremost. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I'm very blessed to have known Ty Lund. He was more than my predecessor. He was a mentor and my friend. It was a great honour. It is a great honour to serve as the MLA for this constituency that Ty represented for six terms and continue some of the work that he began when he was Environment Minister. Each day that I serve in this place, Mr. Speaker, I aim to serve my constituents with the same commitment and enthusiasm that Ty served them with. I will miss Ty's advice and his kindness and his legendary stories. I will miss his friendship and his passion for our home. Ty was a determined and dedicated man often intense and persuasive, but he was always guided by his huge, genuine servant heart. I extend my sincere condolences to Ty's family and to the people of Rimby Rocky Mountain Host Sundry and to my colleagues here in the Assembly on the loss of a leader and, most importantly, on the loss of a friend. the member for Edmonton Beverly Clareview. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today we remember former Progressive Conservative MLA Ty Lund, who passed away at the age of 82. MLA Lund was born in Rocky Mountain House on March 31, 1938, and his family had been farmers for two generations, and he was proud to continue that family tradition. MLA Lund also was involved in his community. He was involved in a number of organizations like the local 4-H club and the Kinsman Club. He began his political career as councillor for the Municipal District of Clearwater in Rocky Mountain House in 1980, serving as a reeve for the last four years until 1989. In 1989, he was elected as the MLA for Rocky Mountain House under the PC party, a seat he held for six consecutive terms until 2012. During his time as MLA, uh, MLA Lund served several cabinet positions. In 1994, Premier Ralph Klein elevated him to Cabinet as Minister of Environmental Protections. MLA Lund later held portfolios in agriculture, food and rural development, infrastructure and transportation, and government services. Former MLA Lund will be remembered for his longevity in provincial politics and be sorely missed by his children and grandchildren. On behalf of the Official Opposition NDP Caucus, I would like to thank MLA Lund and his family for his years of public service and sacrifice. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member statements. The Honourable the Member for Edmonton City Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, as we ride the rising crest of the third wave of COVID-19, I want to take a moment to speak to health care workers across Alberta. And the first thing I want to say is thank you. I can't even begin to imagine what you've lived through this past year, the fear and anxiety you've faced as you've stepped up time after time to care for our friends, families, and loved ones in some of the most difficult times of their lives. Thank you for being there when we could not. Thank you for tending to their most intimate needs, for preparing their food, washing their sheets, and cleaning their rooms, for holding their hands, for comforting their fear, easing their suffering, and affirming their humanity, their worth as they left this world. Thank you for your dedication, your commitment to put their needs, their health first, even at potential risk of your own, and using every tool at your disposal, every last drop of effort to do it. Secondly, I want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it's been so much worse than it had to be, that you've had to bear the brunt of a lack of leadership by your government for the disruption they force you to endure as they put their own political agendas ahead of supporting you in the midst of likely the most difficult health crisis our province has ever faced. That your investment of blood, sweat and tears has so often been met with disrespect, with callous indifference to the impacts of their decisions on your work and your own physical and mental health. That your work continues to be undermined by individuals, even elected officials, who deny the reality of what you face in an utterly inexplicable refusal to fairly and consistently enforce our public health restrictions. For the weight of the unthinkably difficult decisions you've had to make and the weight, the scars you will bear after this is done. But for now, this continues. It didn't have to be this way, but sadly it is. But despite all this, I know all of you, though worn and weary, are committed to seeing this through. Thank you for that, too, and I'm sorry. You are seen. You are valued. You are heroes. The Honourable Member for Lydie Beaumont. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On April 9, 1917, the Canadian Armed Forces participated in the beginning of the Battle of Emmy Ridge, which resulted in the deaths of 3,598 Canadians and another 7,000 wounded. And on the 114th anniversary of this significant moment in Canadian military history, the NDP want to thank them by phasing them out. Keep in mind the federal NDP and the provincial NDP are the same party with one membership. It isn't unusual for the NDP to come up with some radical ideology, but I was astounded by the motion being brought forward. The motion states that an NDP government would commit to phasing out the Canadian Armed Forces, that Armed Forces units claim needless lives, and pose an overall net negative impact on the communities where our members serve. I am assuming from this that the NDP see every army as the same, and that they have no appreciation for the sacrifices of our armed forces. What's the NDP's message on this? Thanks for the freedom, and that you're no longer required. The motion goes on to state that militaries in war are historic institutions with no place in modern society, and then suggests that Canada should take the path of turning over the defence of our country to another country, likely one with an army. And despite the naive viewpoint of the NDP, threats of armed conflict remain. Not only do our armed forces members protect us from external threats and participate in peacekeeping missions overseas, they support our communities here at home. In times of crisis, our forces members have always stepped up to support our communities through natural disasters as an example. This is also a complete disregard of the families, the spouses, partners and children. Your sacrifice was not for someone the NDP holds in high regard. It was for someone the NDP sees as causing needless death. Nobody wishes for war, but the men and women who serve our country are ready to defend this nation. They deserve more respect, and if the NDP had the ability to feel more than just anger and hatred, then this would be the moment they feel ashamed. Honourable Members, order. I would just remind all members that uh, member statements, the long-standing tradition of the um, assembly is that members go uninterrupted for, for whatever reason, even if that's encouraged. Um, it is now 1.50, and that makes it oral question period. And the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition has the call. Four thousand new cases in just four days. 
Mr. Speaker, the third wave is here and it is rising. We must take every measure we can to protect Albertans and protect our economy from the rapid spread of COVID-19. Yet faced with deeply concerning numbers, the Premier failed to act over the long weekend, instead opting for another lecture. What happened? The bars were packed, the roads were busy, and Grace Life had record attendance. The Premier himself said his modelling showed 1,000 people in hospital, and still he did nothing. To the Premier, what is he waiting for? The Honourable Minister of Health has risen. Mr. Speaker, uh we um, will be having an announcement with Dr. Henshaw and Premier later on this afternoon. I invite the uh, Honourable uh, Member to, uh, to watch along. Uh, but the, she is right that the cases are increasing. It is a concern for government and for those in the Ministry of Health. And we will continue to monitor the situation. We will continue to make sure that our public health officials have all the resources available to them, and AHS as well, to make sure that throughout the pandemic, people will have all, all the care that they need throughout the pandemic in AHS facilities and otherwise, to make sure that people um, were protecting lives and livelihoods throughout this pandemic, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is the legislature. We could use an answer now and in here. There's no doubt that business owners and workers will be impacted. I know how hard this pandemic has been on them. But there are just two theories for protecting the economy. One, you step up with real support for businesses and for workers. Or two, you look the other way while more Albertans get sick, more die, and ultimately our economy recovery still fails. Ontario, BC, Saskatchewan, Quebec have all opted for the first option. Why is our Premier op opting for the second? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Jobs, the Economy and Innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to the supporting businesses across Alberta, Mr. Speaker, our relaunch grant supported over 70,000 businesses here in Alberta, Mr. Speaker. We've had applications for support of up to $600 million right here in Alberta, Mr. Speaker. We'll put this program up against any other province, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes to turnaround time, it's about 10 days' time, Mr. Speaker. If further health measures are required, we'll continue to be there with expanded supports for businesses in Alberta. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, there's hundreds of millions of dollars that still haven't gotten out the door. Now, meanwhile, the Premier wags his finger, but his photos of the bars on Sunday night show is not working. He can't enforce the rules on his own caucus, let alone groups like Grace Life, who put people at risk whenever they get together. That's the thing about losing your moral authority, Mr. Speaker. Eventually, you just lose all authority. Will the Premier commit to stop blaming Albertans, put in new restrictions, enforce them consistently, and then actually save lives and livelihoods? The Honourable the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, as I said, we will have an announcement later on today. But uh, look, the, the question is about enforcement, as the uh, member has brought up a couple times. As we just to remind the, the member, even though she was a former premier of the province, Mr. Speaker, that politicians should not be interfering in enforcement decisions, but should leave those decisions to the agencies who can enforce the laws that we decide, either as the executive or as the legislature, Mr. Speaker. And we'll continue to make sure that AHS has the resources that they need to be able to enforce the public health measures, and as well, any other agency that they may um, have the, the need to assist them with in doing so. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, if the Premier is wondering why his approval rate keeps dropping, look at the backwards regressive curriculum he wants to teach our kids for a hint. This curriculum contains serious F errors, in fact. It ignores modern teaching practices. It diminishes the role of human-caused climate change. It fails to follow the recommendations of the TRC. It contains plagiarized sections. And worst of all, it simply does not prepare our kids for the future. To the Premier, his example of leadership is questionable at best. Can he not understand why no one wants his curriculum being taught to the leaders of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The Honourable the Minister of Education is risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I can assure everyone here that the curriculum has been created over a very, very long, detailed process that lasted well over 19 months, took into account the previous version of the curriculum. We had educational leaders. We had experts in the areas of uh, various subjects. We had over 100 teachers involved in the redrafting of it. We also had deans and academics. All were involved to create this curriculum. The Leader of the Opposition. And today those deans said they do not endorse it. Now the Premier says, quote, there's widespread acclaim 
but here's what people actually say. It perpetuates rather than addresses systemic racism. That's the chiefs of Treaty 6. I would call it a trivial pursuit or jeopardy curriculum. That's U of A professor Carla Peck. To be blunt, I feel it's a flaming garbage. That's Taylor Schroeder, one of 33,000 Alberta parents already organizing against this. So to the Premier, does the curriculum teach kids what the words widespread and acclaim mean? Because he might want to drop in for a class if it does. The Honourable Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, all students will learn the history of racism and discrimination in North America and specifically in Alberta. I would like to read a quote from Mohamed Awanda, the co-chair of Alberta's Anti-Racism Advisory Council, and I quote, It warms my heart as an Im immigrant raising my two kids in Calgary to see our government acknowledging the Muslim community in one of the most significant ways, which is education. I believe that this will be the start of a new era for Alberta, where all students will learn about the diverse, inclusive and multicultural communities that form our unique society. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, I would suggest the minister listen to the students who are Métis, who are Indigenous, who are Francophone. Just those ones today have talked about how they are not seen in this curriculum. Now, this curriculum uh, copied off of Wikipedia. It, uh, it uh, uh, included a massive bit of, of, uh, of plagiarism. Does the Premier not understand that the reason no one wants to see his personal values in the curriculum is because those values, just like him, are significantly out of touch with what Alberta is and what, what Alberta parents The Honourable the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, I was surprised to hear these allegations surface over the weekend. As the members opposite know, curriculum documents in Alberta are not footnoted with citations. Hundreds, hundreds of people have had a hand in drafting the new K-6 curriculum through a very transparent review process. This includes subject matter experts, teachers and my department staff that have worked directly on the curriculum. I'm sure the member opposite does not want to accuse any of those people with plagiarism. The order, order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Glenora has a question. Mr. Speaker, I was gobsmacked last week when the Premier claimed he received, quote, widespread endorsements for his new curriculum. My inbox certainly suggests otherwise. And to date, five school boards at least have publicly refused to participate in piloting the new curriculum due to concerns that have been raised by their subject matter experts, thousands of parents, teachers, students, Indigenous leaders, and so on. The negative feedback is overwhelming. Will the current government actually listen to the broad opposition to the curriculum, or are there earplugs still in? The Honourable the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are listening, and in fact, we're listening to all Albertans. We want to hear from every single one. I want them to go to alberta.ca slash curriculum and fill in the survey. Read, read the actual 500 plus pages of the curriculum. But Mr. Speaker, the purpose of a pilot for the draft curriculum is to provide valuable in-classroom feedback to affect potential changes for the final document. School divisions can opt to pilot all or some of the draft curriculum subjects. For example, they could pilot math or just language arts. Mr. Speaker, if some school divisions do not wish to pilot, they will simply not be able to provide direct in-class feedback or potential changes. We want them to pilot it. Edmonton Glenora. Well, they've given their feedback, Minister, and they think that your curriculum is a mess. One of the major concerns with the curriculum is that it outright ignores the calls to action through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and chooses to focus more on American and European history than Canadian history. We had the pleasure of being joined today by Charles Barner, an 11-year-old Métis student from here in Edmonton, and he noted that the Minister of Education promised that all students would see themselves in the curriculum. But he said he doesn't, not one bit. To the Premier, will you explain to 11-year-old Charles why the UCP government has failed him so miserably and why his own culture and heritage are taking a back seat in Grade 2 to Genghis Khan and Charlemagne? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased that First Nations, Métis and Inuit content will be taught in every single grade from kindergarten all the way through to grade six and beyond as we develop the future curriculum. This was a very important commitment we made to Albertans and I'm glad to say we delivered on it. I, I actually have a quote from Grand Chief Wilton Littlechild, who was the commissioner on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, who believes this curriculum is consistent with the Truth and Reconciliation C Curriculum or Commission, and I quote, 
education in general is the key to reconciliation with the work the done today. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Glenora, has the call. Elder Betty, the Métis Nation, Treaty 6, all outright refute what you just said, Minister. They are upset and they want you to go back to the drawing board. We have been swamped with thousands upon thousands of inquiries from parents, teachers, subject matter experts, students, and so on. Albertas are begging this Premier to hit the brakes on this bogus curriculum and to go back to the drawing board and do real consultation on what is taught in Alberta classrooms. To the Premier, I'm putting forward a motion for an emergency debate this afternoon on the lack of support for this new curriculum. Will the Premier allow the debate to continue and will he commit to being here so we can actually hear what Albertans are saying? Honourable Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, first I want to thank Elder Betty for the work that she uh, did on our curriculum. She uh, was very collaborative. She had put forward many recommendations, which I'm happy to say all were implemented and taken into account when we developed the curriculum. And in fact, over the 12 days that she was involved in developing curriculum, she billed our government for $5,000. So during this work, she made several recommendations to improve the First Nation, Métui and Inuit curriculum, and all, again, I repeat, all of her recommendations were implemented in the draft that we have today. Of course, there's always room for improvement, and we look forward to hearing more from her. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, five days have passed since the Alberta government missed the deadline to deliver a plan to spend $148 million in federal money meant for an Alberta jobs program. The only thing this government has done so far is give their non-existent program a name. They ironically called their missing program Jobs Now, but it would have been better called Jobs Maybe or probably Jobs Never. Albertans' workers are in a jobs emergency right now. They need help from this government, and the UCP has failed to deliver yet again. Premier, why is the UCP government so disorganized that it can't even spend federal money that would help create jobs for Albertans who need them? The Honourable Minister of Jobs, the Economy and Innovation. Mr. Speaker, our Minister of Labour is continuing to work with the federal government, as well with the Minister of Finance, to ensure that we continue to provide the programming necessary, Mr. Speaker, to get our economic recovery going. Mr. Speaker, we're proud to make sure that in this last budget, we have have allocated dollars in there for our Jobs Now program, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to be there to support workers that want to get retraining, Mr. Speaker, as well as employers that want to hire Albertans and provide them with the necessary training to get back into the workplace. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. The Minister of Labour, the Minister of Finance, the Premier have all promised that we will see an announcement soon, and yet Albertans are waiting for jobs. This government ran on the promise of jobs, but lost more than 50,000 of them before the pandemic, and many more since. And we currently have the second highest unemployment rate in Canada. And it's very clear from Alberta's economic recovery uh, analysis that we are going to lag behind most other provinces coming out of the pandemic. When will the Premier start delivering on the jobs promises made to Albertans, and why has the government let $148 million of jobs money potentially expire? The Honourable the Minister of Health to answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll remind the House in this room that uh, the difficulty for the last couple of months has been that we didn't receive as a province, or any province, the vaccinations that we were promised by the federal government, which has meant that we've had a difficult time, as all provinces had, to be able to get the vaccinations in the arms of Albertans so that we can continue our relaunch of our economies across the country. It's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, but we have made a promise to Albertans that we will get vaccines in the arms of Albertans as quickly as we receive those vaccines. The trouble is, we just have not received the vaccinations in Q1 that we were promised. Like the Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Mr. Speaker, that had absolutely no relationship to the question I'm asking. The federal government made $185 million available. The federal government said use your existing networks, your existing strong, strong job training. Get this money out and working for Albertans. This government had months to spend it. They were encouraged to get the money out the door. And instead, they trumpeted this program in their no jobs and no plan budget. And now the federal deadline has passed and there really are no jobs and no plan. To the finance minister, can you explain to workers why the government has stalled? Why have you not created the, the program? The Honourable Minister of Finance and the President of Treasury Board. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Firstly, I want to say the budget 2021 was about economic recovery. Firstly, resourcing health to deal with the pandemic. A second priority in positioning the province for economic recovery and growth. And Mr. Speaker, the third priority 
was to ensure that this government delivers government services most efficiently, something the members opposite didn't do one day while they governed. Order, order. The Honourable Member for Calgary East is the one with the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Citizen Initiative Act is a piece of legislation that would allow Albertans to petition for changes in policy. This would enable Albertans to gather support for referendums on important issues and give them a way to voice their concerns and enact changes. To the Minister of Justice, can you explain to Albertans what the Citizen Initiative Act entails and what opportunity it provides for them? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the opportunity to speak on the Citizen Initiative Act. Mr. Speaker, citizens' initiatives are a form of direct democracy, just like the referendum we have seen in Calgary on the Olympics or the United Kingdom's Brexit vote. But unlike those votes, Mr. Speaker, citizens' initiatives are votes on matters determined by the citizens, not the government. As the title of this legislation suggests, Albertans would have the opportunity to place matters directly onto the political agenda by collecting signatures from supportive individuals to initiate a vote, Mr. Speaker. Member for Calgary East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Given that the Citizen Initiative Act provides Albertans with the tools they need to bring change, and given that what has been proposed is a multi-step process, and given that sometimes referendums are necessary and vital to the democratic process, to the same Minister, how can you assure Albertans that this process will be transparent and that their voices will be heard. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the most important things we have done is to establish a legislative committee to review any initiatives before Albertans vote on them. This committee is a critical piece of the process to bring citizen initiatives into law. Should the committee not support the, the initiative, then the public would get an opportunity to vote on the initiative. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, the Chief Electoral Officer would verify signatures to determine if the petition was, successful, was a successful one. These are features that ensure the integrity of the citizen initiative process, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Given that referendums are serious matters and should be taken seriously as ways to affect change, and given that with this legislation, there's a potential of people to fraudulently gather signatures in order to promote policies that may not be in the best interest of all Albertans. To the same Minister, what protections are in place to ensure the system will not be abused? The Honourable the Minister of Justice, Mr. Thank, General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Safeguarding our democracy must be, a, must be at the heart of everything we do as democratically elected officials. For that reason, Mr. Speaker, when signatures are collected, the Chief Electoral Officer will be responsible for verifying every single signature. The Chief Electoral Officer is, is a disinterested, independent third party that has proven itself time and time again to be fully capable of verifying and authenticating our democratic process. Recall as citizen initiative legislation delivers substantial democratic reforms for all Albertans. The Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last summer, Alberta's physicians made it clear where they stand with the Minister of Health when they overwhelmingly voted to express a lack of confidence in him. Last week, they once again made their voices clear when they voted down a new master agreement with this government. Now, the Premier then stated three times that he has 100 percent confidence in this minister, and it's clear that he is the only one that does. So at what point will the Premier finally put the best interests of Albertans before his ego and that of this minister and replace him? The Honourable the Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, this is a, a past year that has been extraordinarily difficult for our front lines, including physicians, as they uh, help to protect patients from COVID-19. And Albertans across the province are grateful to physicians who, along with other health care workers, have made great personal sacrifices to, to keep us safe. And we're disappointed that the deal was narrowly rejected. And, but uh, we will absolutely be sitting down in the near future with the staff and uh, president of the AMA to continue with the momentum that we have built up going into the, uh, the, the drafting of the agreement. Robinson City Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, given that this health minister indeed chose to wage his war on doctors in the midst of a global pandemic, and given that he demonstrated his lack of respect for physicians by calling them at home at night, 
or berating them in their driveways. And given that rather than own up to what is frankly childish behavior, he attempted to gaslight Albertans by claiming that no fight with doctors had happened. You know, it's clear the minister engaged in a deliberate attempt to rewrite history. Can the premier explain to every doctor in the province why he still stands behind him after the disrespect and disregard he's shown to physicians? The Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, this is the behaviour of the NDP. We've seen this for the last year, especially from this member, continuing to try to perpetuate false narratives about this government, about me, about my family. He will continue to behave that way. He'll continue to try to undermine the confidence that people have in our public health system as we continue to reply to the pandemic. Look, Mr. Speaker, we're focused on protecting lives. He can be focused on his childish behaviour. Member for Edmonton City Centre. Given, Mr. Speaker, that any health care worker will tell you it's been this minister who's been undermining our public health care system, and indeed, given that doctors made that 100 percent clear in voting no on this master agreement, and given that the failure to securely deal with doctors may indeed now cause serious challenges with locking in agreements with other essential worker groups, and given I can't find a single doctor or health care worker, for that matter, who's willing to vouch for this minister, this premier, or this government on health care. So I have to ask the premier. I suppose the health minister may be the only person in this province with a lower approval rating than him. Perhaps that's why he keeps him in cabinet. The Honourable the Minister of Health. Again, Mr. Speaker, that's the behaviour of this member. I mean, making false narratives about me calling doctors in the middle of the night, that is his childish behaviour. He will continue to behave this way. We are focused on making sure that the health care system in this province is resourced the way it needs to be. We will continue to focus on lives. We will continue to focus on the pandemic. He can continue to behave in that way and continue to uh, act childishly, Mr. Speaker, while we will continue to focus on the pandemic. Honourable Member for Lethbridge West. Mr. Speaker, cases of COVID are skyrocketing in Lethbridge. So 10 days ago, I called on the government to take action, and it's been 10 days of silence. The people of Lethbridge want daily briefings from the South Zone Medical Director, some daily reporting of our values in the South Zone, expansion of COVID care teams, and more support to local business. To the Minister of Health, he's had 10 days, but taken no public action. Zero. Zilch. Why is the Minister ignoring Lethbridge and not taking the third wave seriously? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, that's not true. We continue to provide support to those who are in Lethbridge. We continue to make sure that the medical officers of health in the South Zone have the resources that they need to be able to respond to the pandemic on the ground. We will continue to make sure that we are following the evidence. We have an announcement, as I said, Mr. Speaker, later on this afternoon, and I look forward to being able to join Dr. Henshaw this afternoon for that announcement. Member for Lethbridge West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that the City of Lethbridge has the highest rate of active cases amongst the province's major cities, given that the Premier told Albertans this past Thursday he has projections that the number of people in hospital is going to skyrocket, will the Minister of Health tell the people of Lethbridge how many people he's been told are projected to be sick with COVID in Lethbridge, or is he hiding that information in the same way he's hiding the plan to respond to COVID and keep us safe? The Honourable the Minister of Health. Okay, Mr. Speaker, this is the behaviour of the NDP, continuing to try to undermine confidence in the health care system during the pandemic, continuing to politicise COVID. It's unfortunate behaviour, Mr. Speaker. They can continue to behave that way. That's up to them. We will be focused on responding to the pandemic, making sure that the health care system has the resources that it needs, and continuing to follow the evidence and make sure that our restrictions are uh, considering the, uh, the, the cases that we have in the province. And as the, the member noted, yes, we, we know that hospitalizations two weeks after cases, we will be able to project those hospitalizations, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Well, given that 10 days ago, Mr. Speaker, I released a substantive plan of specific actions that the minister could just say yes to. And given that the minister has decided that Edmonton and Calgary are worthy of COVID care teams, but so far he's refused to send them to Lethbridge, to the minister, a year into this pandemic, the minister needs to answer why we don't have those COVID care teams. Or his other option is, if he can't provide that answer, just resign. Yeah. The Honourable the Minister of Government Relations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, <laughs> and whatever other things, Mr. Speaker. But uh, I would, I'm happy to tell Remember that the, uh, the uh, government has decided that COVID care teams will be available across Alberta. 
uh, and obviously that includes Lethbridge. So uh, yes, if the honourable member has uh, people that they uh, that uh, she needs to uh, draw to our attention that need their their care, she should let us know. But they we will be out looking for them anyways. The COVID care teams, of course, were a, a community-based groups that started in Calgary and Edmonton. It was such a good idea. We decided to spread it across the province. So the honourable member, I hope, will feel good about that. My apologies to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. The honourable member for Sherwood Park is next. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tech investment in this province is on the rise with a significant announcement coming out of Calgary. Infosys is increasing their Calgary workforce from 7 to 500 employees over the next two years, with a potential to create 2,000 more jobs in the years that follow. This is obviously very good news for our province, and I would definitely like to see more tech investment in the future. To the Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation, why are we, see why are we now seeing such a large increase in tech investment in our province? Well, the Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation. To that member, they rightly note the amount, amount of momentum in the technology space here in Alberta. And just from a recent report from the Canadian Venture Capital Association, in 2018, about $100 million was invested in venture capital in Alberta. In 2019, that increased to $220 million. And just in 2020, that increased to $455 million. That is a huge record for the province of Alberta. Alberta doubled in 2020 when the rest of Canada went down 30%. This is huge for job creation here in Alberta. This money goes towards creating jobs in our province, helps us diversify our economy, Mr. Speaker. We're looking forward for more positive news in this space in the years to come. The member for Sherwood Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. Given that Infosys is not the only tech company recently to invest in this province, and given that other companies such as the Vancouver-based uh, company mCloud, which is moving its head office to Calgary, and Jobber, which is planning on doubling its staff in Edmonton, are also taking advantage of what our province has to offer to the same Minister. Why is all this investment so significant, and what is the overall benefit to these communities as a result? Well, the Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation. Well, Mr. Speaker, the simple answer is thousands of jobs, and which also helps us diversify our economy here in Alberta. Mr. Speaker, the, we asked the Innovation Capital Working Group for advice last year on how do we accelerate the growth in this space in Alberta. Two big recommendations that they had. One was put in place the Innovation Employment Grant, which furthers research and development here in Alberta. The other piece was make sure we have more dollars going into venture capital. So we put $175 million into the Crown Corporation, the Alberta Enterprise Corporation, Mr. Speaker. Those are smart policies. We're listening to the advice of experts, Mr. Speaker, and we're encouraged by the development of our tech sector here in Alberta. Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the Minister. Given that this tech investment is clearly very important to the growth of our economy provincially, and given that this also marks Alberta as a competitive business partner globally in the tech market, and given that these tech investments clearly benefit the local communities both directly and indirectly, to the same minister, what is our government doing to continue to attract and maintain all this investment and growth from the tech industry? The minister. Mr. Speaker, Alberta doesn't want to just be a player in the tech space, Mr. Speaker. We want to become a dominant player in Canada in the tech space. That's why Alberta Innovates just recently launched a request for proposals with respect to establishing or furthering accelerators here in Alberta, Mr. Speaker. That provides mentorship, Mr. Speaker, to these fast-growing startup companies that go from a handful of employees one year to hundreds of employees within a handful of months, Mr. Speaker. We want to see them be successful. That's why we're investing in that exact area. Member for Edmonton Manning has a question. Mr. Speaker, on April 18th, the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry held a town hall with workers on Cargill who were concerned about the safety of their workplace, where the Minister reassured the workers that their work site was safe. Only it wasn't. Shortly before that telephone town hall, the Minister was briefed by officials that two workers with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency had contracted COVID-19 from the Cargill plant. Two days after this town hall, the plant was idled and went on to become the largest outbreak in North America. To the Minister, why did you withhold this vital, life-saving information from the workers at Cargill? The Honourable the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, there again is the NDP playing political games uh, with a pandemic, Mr. Speaker, in an unprecedented situation. 
that our province and the world is facing, Mr. Speaker. Our Minister of Agriculture is doing a great job leading an industry, Mr. Speaker, that is holding our province together, that is having one of the most successful years last year and this year that has had in the history of our province, Mr. Speaker. He's going to keep doing that at the same time as working with the rest of the Cabinet, the Health Minister, to manage the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. And Albertans can rest assured we're not going to play NDP games. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manor. Well, Mr. Speaker, given that the minister, while withholding life-saving information from the cargo workers, told them everything that needs to be done, both to keep people safe and the food supply maintained, is being done. But given that nearly half the workforce at the plant inevitably tested positive for COVID-19 and three people actually died as a result of the outbreak at the plant. To the minister, did the government hold back critical information from workers so that they wouldn't refuse unsafe work, as was their rights? The Honourable Government Health Leader. Mr. Speaker, again, our deepest sympathies go out to the families of anybody who has lost their life as a result of uh, COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, which is why our Health Minister, our Premier, and our government continue to fight each and every day to help manage the province through that pandemic. And again, Mr. Speaker, though, we won't be playing the politics that the NDP play. Albertans want us to get our province back on track and continue to manage our way through the pandemic, Mr. Speaker, and set up Alberta for success, not play petty partisan games that the NDP keep doing, Mr. Speaker. Again, we're going to be focused on getting going, and we're proud of the Minister of Agriculture and the great work he's doing with the agriculture industry inside our province. The Honourable Member. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that the Premier was sought to cover for his minister and the failure of his government by blaming the workers of Cargill for the spread of COVID-19 in the plant and the surrounding community, but given that the Minister of Agriculture actually knew that this facility was not safe, and that COVID-19 was being transmitted in the tight working quarters within the plant. And given that the government has lost all trust and credibility when it comes to keeping workers at Cargill and those across the province safe from COVID-19, will the government stand and commit to a full public inquiry into the outbreak at Cargill and the other plants so that we can ensure justice is served for the families who lost their loved ones? The Honourable the Minister of Health. True at all, but I would remind the member and uh, the House again, Mr. Speaker, that we were the first province to begin a review of our response to the pandemic, so we can continue to to learn and uh, build on the the pandemic response plan that was last amended in 2014, and we'll be making that uh, that report, that review, public, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to learn from the uh, response. We will continue to also. Uh, be able to, uh, we have uh, started uh, actually back in 2019, Mr. Speaker, a view of continuing care, which will also be able to learn from uh, the continuing care situation under COVID. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Beverly Clairview. Mr. Speaker, businesses are already being affected by the third wave. James, owner of Pazzo Pazzo Restaurant, stated because of the increased case counts and threat of the variants, he's seen a 70% revenue drop. And the new grant of 15% of one month's revenue will do little to help him survive. James is not alone in his criticism of this government's support. Even before the current spike in cases, CFIB said the government's new program will be utterly insufficient. To the minister, small businesses continue to hang on by a threat. And with the third wave affecting revenues, is this government going to step up and provide any form of support that will actually help? The Honourable Minister of Jobs, the Economy and Innovation. Mr. Speaker, this government will continue to be there to support small businesses and medium-sized businesses across Alberta throughout this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, our relaunch grant was one of the most successful business support programs done by any province in this country. Over 70,000 businesses have taken part of that, Mr. Speaker. Over almost $600 million has been dedicated to this program, Mr. Speaker. There's going to be an announcement later this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, on health parameters. We're going to continue to be there to provide supports to businesses. Look for further expanded resources coming to businesses here soon. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Beverly Clairview with no preamble. Given the government ended this successful program then, which makes no sense, and given there's uh, there are certain businesses that have been hit harder during the pandemic, hotels, music venues, gyms and theatres, and given that with the increase of cases and threat of the third wave, most businesses can already see the writing on the wall. Either lowered consumer confidence or public health orders, they'll be struggling for many more months. Given this minister foolishly stated that he's ruled out any sector-specific support, meaning the hardest hit businesses have to compete with everybody else for the same piece of the pie. To the minister, does your government still not have any plans to support the worst hit businesses? 
Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation. Mr. Speaker, maybe the member opposite should deviate from their notes because the answer before, Mr. Speaker, said yes. We're going to continue to be there to support small businesses across Alberta, Mr. Speaker. We in Alberta have the best design program in the entire country when it comes to supporting small businesses. The turnaround time on average is 10 days. We'd put that number up against any province in the country. $600 million of support already out the door. Mr. Speaker, it's sad to lecture somebody who's been in this House for six years as to what fiscal year ends are, but their fiscal year end was the end of March. Mr. Speaker, we're in April now. We're going to continue to have supports for small businesses in Alberta. Well, member. Given that this government reports $125 million in unspent funding that was supposed to help struggling businesses keep their doors open and Albertans employed, but you failed. You failed to get the money from the federal government. Given that the Premier himself stated the provided supports are not enough. Quote, it's true that not all supports is going to be enough to help all of them survive, which means that this government is aware and okay with businesses closing their doors forever. To the Minister. Why is this government willfully not providing enough support to keep small businesses afloat? The original money promised to Alberta small businesses still hasn't been spent. Has your whole given up? Is the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite does not understand programs, Mr. Speaker, provided by different ministries. We're talking about the relaunch grant here, Mr. Speaker. Over almost $600 million has been dedicated to this, Mr. Speaker. Those applications just closed March 31st. Those funds are going to continue to flow. Average turnaround time, 10 days. It's sad that a member that has been in this House for six years, that used to be a cabinet minister, does not understand basic programs of government, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to be there for small businesses, Mr. Speaker. We have been from the beginning of this pandemic. We'll continue to be there all the way through. The member for Peace River has a question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Education is foundational to our society because it informs the beliefs, values, and views of Albertans and our children. Unfortunately, woke educational fads have become increasingly common, focusing instead of on educational knowledge and important skills on these fads. To the Minister of Education, how will the new curriculum incorporate skills, competencies and key knowledge to set future generations of Albertans up for success? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Parents have been very clear that they expect Alberta's education system to provide their children with a strong foundation of essential skills and knowledge. The draft K-6 curriculum equips students with foundational reading, writing, and math skills, which parents have told us are vital to ensuring their children's future success. This curriculum moves away from experimental teaching methods and provides clear, specific details about the knowledge and foundational skills that all elementary students must learn in each subject and grade. I'm so pleased that Albertans are reviewing and discussing the draft curriculum. We appreciate their feedback. The Honourable Member for Peace River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that in the face of heckles from members opposite from Edmonton, Glenora and others, Albertans and Canadians still face record levels of debt, and particularly credit card, mortgage, vehicle payment debt, given that many people have overburdened themselves with these payments, and given that a good understanding of financial literacy is intrinsic to a bright future for Albertans, can the Minister please answer how this curriculum that you developed in consultation with Albertans and experts focuses on financial literacy, not some ideology based on the belief that everything in life is free? The Honourable Minister of Education. I couldn't agree more. The new curriculum equips students with foundational reading, writing and math skills while introducing substantive studies on Albertan, Canadian and world history. We are preparing students for success by focusing on literacy, numeracy, practical skills and citizenship. The curriculum will also have an increased focus on the development of work ethic, civic participation and citizenship, financial literacy, digital training, public speaking, critical thinking and respect for different views. The new curriculum delivers on our commitment to Albertans to restore excellence in education. The Honourable Member. Thank you to the Minister through the Speaker. Given that education takes place at such an important time in our children's development, and given that so many academics and so-called experts use education as a chemistry set to test new educational theories developed in a laboratory, completely detached from reality of life outside, given that these woke pedagogical fads have proven to be ineffective at teaching and retaining knowledge that kids need for success, given that the minister is here, can she please explain how this curriculum will take fads out of the classroom 
and stick to proven sound teaching approaches and content with knowledge that will lead to the best outcomes for Alberta. The Minister Order. The Minister of Education has the call. Mr. Speaker, the draft K-6 curriculum moves away from experimental teaching methods and provides clear, specific details about the knowledge and foundational skills that all elementary students must learn in each subject and grade and that both parents and teachers can read and understand. Thanks to the Ministerial Order on Student Learning signed in August, teachers will no longer be required to teach using uh, teaching math using discovery or inquiry methods. The new draft K-6 curriculum removes the requirements that force teachers to use a particular method of teaching. We are seeing a decline in our international education rankings over the past number of years. We need to get back. The Honourable Member for Order. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Gold Bar has the call. <laughs> Albertans got a good look at the commitment that this government has to consultation when the Minister of Energy lifted the 1976 Lougheed Coal Policy on the Friday before a long weekend without letting a single Albertan know. Now, in response to widespread public outrage, the Minister backtracked a bit, launched a panel, and a vague online survey that contains only leading questions. When will the Minister look Albertans in the eyes and explain why she believes that she needs to tear down the Rocky Mountains to mine coal? Honourable Minister of Environment and Parks. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Energy has made it clear that tearing down the mountains and mountaintop removal mining is illegal inside this province, Mr. Speaker, despite the fact that that member continues uh, to perpetuate the NDP making things up inside this chamber, Mr. Speaker. But let me be clear, the NDP, they want to talk about consultation, Mr. Speaker, that member was part of a government that sent out letters to the coal industry that allowed them to be able to apply for mines on Category 2 land inside this province, Mr. Speaker. Wow. And as the Minister of Energy has said, she's looking forward to hearing from them at her panel, which is true consultation, Mr. Speaker, and Albertans would like to hear whether that position has changed for the member of Edmonton Goldbar. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Goldbar. Given that even if I wanted to, I couldn't because their survey is so loaded, and given that most Albertans, including myself, in, uh, expect online meetings and the opportunity to talk about the perils of tearing up the Rocky Mountains with the Minister and maybe even the Premier, and given that now the Minister is appearing, uh, is appearing to be in hiding, and given that the Minister said that water quality and protection won't even be included in the terms of reference of the consultation, to the Minister, isn't protecting our water from the dangers of coal mining a priority? If the minister is going to do a pretend consultation, shouldn't she at least pretend to care about water quality? I um, would encourage the member to not make an accusation about the Minister of Education of Energy um, and just perhaps rephrase the question in a way that's more parliamentary. The Honourable Minister of Environment and Parks. Mr. Speaker, the Energy Minister has put together a panel of world-class individuals to work on this important issue with Albertans. Mr. Speaker, one of the things that she will be addressing through that process is that the former NDP government sent out letters approving mines on some of the most protected landscapes inside uh, this province, Mr. Speaker. But when it comes to water, Mr. Speaker, water is already protected within our province or any things like the Water Act, which are to come along significantly after the 1976 coal policy, Mr. Speaker are significantly stricter, Mr. Speaker. And unless the member from Edmonton Goldbar is asking us to take our water policy and put it all the way back 50 years, Mr. Speaker, I think we'll continue to work with the Alberta Water Act, which is one of the strictest in the world. The Honourable Member Goldbar. Well, given the minister is monkeying with the old man water allocation order, so I'm sure that he uh, has some strong opinions on the Water Act, given that tomorrow Alberta's official opposition will propose a bill to ban coal mining in our eastern slopes until an enhanced regional plan is put in place to protect water in beautiful natural spaces, and given that we're putting this bill forward following consultation and submissions from the thousands and th upon thousands of Albertans who were clear that they don't want strip mining in the Rocky Mountains. Can the Minister explain why we managed to consult with Albertans and make changes to prevent damages to coal mines while she can't? The Honourable the Minister of Environment. Well, thanks. Mr. Speaker, there is the NDP making things up again. There has been no changes to the water allocations associated with coal. That is completely and utterly false, Mr. Speaker. Let me be clear on that. No changes to the water allocation, Mr. Speaker. There was some proposals to increase allocations for environmental purposes to protect fish. I don't know if the member from Edmonton Goldbar is now against fish and protected habitat, Mr. Speaker, but this government is focused on conservation. We'll continue to, Mr. Speaker. We support the Minister of Energy's consultation with her panel, Mr. Speaker. A sharp contrast from that member and their former government who never consulted Albertans on anything. The Honourable Member for Edmonton-White Mud. 
Mr. Speaker, last week this government cancelled the $25 per day child care pilot program, leaving thousands of family and child care operators stranded. Concerned parents and board members stood with me, begging this government to reconsider their decision. Ryan Way, who is a father and sits on the board of Building Blocks Daycare in Grand Prairie, said that the pilot provided much needed funding that allowed them to pay and keep staff, buy supplies and keep their centre functioning. To the Minister of Children's Services, what does the government have to say to operators who are now laying off staff and losing families who can no longer afford childcare because of the end of this program? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, this was a three-year pilot program implemented by the previous government that did not benefit as many children and families as it should have. And we respect parent choice, and the data is telling us that one out of seven parents choose licensed child care in Alberta. The minister is making long-term and substantive changes to the system to ensure that high-quality child care is available and affordable, and in fact, some low-income families are now paying as little as $13 per day in the centre of their choosing. The Honourable Member for Edmonton White Mud. Thank you. Given that low income families paid $0 per day under the $25 per day program and that it served 7,500 children and created 1,740 new childcare spaces across Alberta, and given that this pilot was received so positively by families, operators, and the third party evaluators, and given that a new study from the CCPA stated that high childcare fees are linked to low. The Minister is making long term and substantive changes to the system to ensure that high quality childcare is available and affordable. And, Mr. Speaker, through an agreement with the federal government, we have enhanced our child care subsidy model so that about 1,600 lower income families pay the equivalent of $25 per day or less in child care fees. And this, uh, these additional spaces should also translate to additional jobs. Member for Edmonton White Bud. Given that the minister heard directly from child care operators in a UCP town hall last week that they are turning away families because these families can't afford it, and given that in an interview last week, Brad West from the Glengarry Child Care Centre said the minister is, quote, causing so much damage to the sector that with another two years under her leadership, I don't think we'll ever be able to recover from what she's doing. To the minister, those who actually work in child care believe the policies being put forward by your government will ruin it for good. Will your government stop the damage right now, reinstate and expand the $25 per day child care program. The Honourable Minister of Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, I can assure you that the Minister of Children's Services is listening to parents and to service providers across the province. And in conjunction with the federal government, more inclusive child care spaces have been introduced, and that will uh, in turn um, result in more jobs. In November of 2020, the changes that were introduced reduced child care fees for more than 21,000 children. Honourable Member, First Bruce Grove, Stony Plain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Law enforcement plays an important role in our society. The women and men from the RCMP and other police services risk their lives every day to protect their communities while providing essential services so that our families can live and play without fear. As, in, as an MLA for a riding that is protected by the RCMP, can the Minister of Justice and Solicitor General please explain the process that the government is taking in the consideration of a provincial police force? The Honourable Minister of Justice and the Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Spruce Grove Stony Plain for that very important question. Mr. Speaker, as the member know, the government returned PricewaterhouseCoopers to, to you know, conduct a feasibility study, what we call a police, provincial police uh, uh, transition study, to determine whether or not it is feasible at this point in time for the province to embark on their own provincial police. M Mr. Speaker, we are expecting that particular report, and once we have the report, obviously we will share that particular report with the people of Alberta. The Honourable Member for Spruce Grove, Stony Plain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that the union representing RCMP officers has started a campaign in opposition to Alberta adopting a provincial police force, and given that the campaign warns of higher costs for fewer services, and that the transition may result in fewer police officers, which would be worrying for many Albertans, including the residents of Spruce Grove and Stony Plain, can the same minister please respond to these concerns and let us know how a provincial police force would rectify these problems? the Minister of Justice and Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While it is true that there are special interests out there who are already campaigning uh, against the idea of a feasibility study with respect to the provincial police uh, transition study, Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, you know, this study is all about making sure that we, we come up with a model of community policing in the 21st century. 
And Mr. Speaker, we are going to make sure that the factors and the realities on the ground dictate how we proceed going forward and not on the basis of special interests who are, com who are already campaigning against the idea of a study. The Honourable Member. Thank you to the Minister for his answer. Given that Albertans' opinions on policing may vary in communities served by the RCMP compared to those served by municipal police forces such as Edmonton and Calgary, and given that a majority of the province's population lives in cities that are not protected by the RCMP, to the same minister, can he please outline next steps once the report is received? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member once again, this transition study will provide Alberta's government with an evidence-based and objective assessment of the factors associated with establishing an Alberta Provincial Police to assist Cabinet to consider the failed use panel's recommendation. After reviewing the, the Pricewaterhouse Keeper's findings, the Alberta government will make a decision about whether to continue studying the feasibility of establishing a Provincial Police. If Cabinet decides to proceed, Mr. Speaker, I can assure that there will be more analysis that the Government of Alberta will continue to consult with key stakeholders. Members, this concludes the time allotted for oral question period. In 30 seconds or less, we will return to member statements. the Honourable Member for Brooks Medicine Hat has risen with a member statement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been three years since the tragic accident that claimed the lives of 16 promising individuals, physically injured 13 more, and impacted hockey fans around the globe. For the survivors, friends, and family of the Humboldt Broncos, the emotional pain that they feel, as well as the scars from their physical injuries, may never fully heal. The impact of the crash near Armley, Saskatchewan rippled through every community across Canada. Despite cheering for different teams, we were all Broncos on that day. While many of us didn't have the honour of knowing those involved, we all know someone who could have easily been in that scenario. Many have watched their children, friends and loved ones board a bus for a sports trip or have even been a part of one of those groups themselves. Because of our shared experiences and love for the game of hockey, this tragedy hit home in a profound way. While we remember those affected by this catastrophic accident, the stories of perseverance from survivors, the generosity of everyone who gave generously, and the empathy shown by a nation inspires us all and lives on. Many still have their sticks out, for, sticks out for Humboldt on their front porches. Stories of persistence and determination emerging from the crash continue to, to provide a source of inspiration for fans. People like Ryan Strashnitsky continue to share his story of recovery and motivates us all, especially those working on their own physical injuries by returning to the ice through sledge hockey. I know that many of those who have lost family and friends in, this, in the accident often wonder if they are the last ones who will remember. But the City of Humboldt and the team have announced plans to make sure that the memory lives on by building a state-of-the-art tribute centre to honour those, honor those lives. A fundraising campaign has began to raise $25, $25 million for a gallery, ice surface, physiotherapy centre that will continue to aid in the healing process with several businesses and individuals already committing to help. Mr. Speaker, I hope and pray that survivors, families and friends can be encouraged that I and many others honour the memory of those that we lost and uh, support them as they continue to grieve. May all those who are affected feel our support today and every day as we remain humble, strong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member. I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton Rutherford has a statement to make. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Albertans were disappointed when the UCP used their first act to kill the Indigenous Climate Leadership Initiative. We're concerned when the government defunded the 60 Scoop Society, we're annoyed when they gutted the Urban Indigenous Programming, and we're angry when the UCP government introduced a bill to alter the Métis Settlement Act without consulting the Métis people. After learning about the draft curriculum, Albertans are disappointed, concerned, annoyed, and angry again. The Truth and Reconciliation Call to Action number 62 asks that the government, uh, to, the government to make age-appropriate curriculum on residential schools, treaties and Aboriginal peoples, historical and contemporary contributions to Canada, a mandatory education requirement for kindergarten to grade 12 students. This is what the Confederacy of Treaty 6 First Nations Chiefs had to say about the curriculum. 
what was anticipated to be an opportunity to tell future generations of Albertas about the fulsome and diverse history of this province, including the histories of treaties First Nations that have existed here since time immemorial, has instead devolved into a Eurocentric, American-focused, Christian-dominated narrative that perpetuates rather than addresses systemic racism. And here are the comments of the Métis Nation of Alberta. The draft curriculum was disheartening, to say the least, and a shock to our citizens who saw their input and collaboration reduced to nothing more than a side note mentioned of the Métis, while the tone of your message carried a Eurocentric American point of view, effectively eliminating the voice and history of the Métis Nation of Alberta. Dr. Pam Roach notes that the curriculum has continual references to Indigenous people in the past tense, had different languages, had traditions and protocols for gifting. She replies, nice try at erasure here, but Indigenous people are very much alive today. Premier, stop trying to erase Indigenous people, stop the draft curriculum, and work with Indigenous people to produce a fulsome and meaningful history and a robust accounting of contemporary lived experience. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cardston Siksika has a statement. Last week, Alberta's government released their curriculum, or rather draft curriculum for K-6 to here in Alberta. This fulfills a campaign promise we made to Albertans in the last election. We committed to end the focus on so-called discovery learning, scrap the NDP's secretive curriculum review, and replace it with a new curriculum based on input from teachers, parents, and subject matter experts. I'm proud to say that we have delivered on this commitment, another promise made and a promise kept. Alberta's new curriculum is focused on teaching essential knowledge and skills. After years of declining student academic performance in literacy and math, the new curriculum will renew the importance of teaching fund, uh, foundational knowledge across all subjects to better prepare students for success. It has been almost 30 years since some of the subjects in K-6 have been updated. The world has changed, so should our curriculum. Alberta's new curriculum is founded on four key learning themes, literacy, numeracy, citizenship, and strong practical skills. Studying mathematics can prepare students for jobs in computer science, construction, artificial intelligence, teaching, restaurant, the restaurant industry, and many other fields. By leaving behind the focus on discovery math, students will use tried and true methods to learn foundational math skills, and understand numbers and objects in order to solve problems confidently. Under the NDP, students were not required to learn about money or develop financial literacy skills. With our new curriculum, students will learn a range of practical skills that will prepare them for success. This includes basic financial literacy, budget planning, and computer coding. As a father, I understand the importance of ensuring that our schools are preparing students for the real world. And that's why I'm proud to support Alberta's new curriculum. I'm confident Alberta's new K-6 curriculum will once again put Alberta students at the very top and prepare every student in Carson Siksika and Alberta for life of personal success. The Honourable Member for Edmonton McClung. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Exactly three weeks ago, I stood in this House and called on the government to get to work building the Green Line. The deadline to start construction was quickly approaching, and this government needed to quit delaying if we were to get shovels in the ground this year. Unfortunately, that deadline has come and gone without any action from this government. Instead, the project continues to sit on the Minister's desk while Calgarians wait for the economic benefits of this project. The Green Line is critical to revitalizing Calgary's downtown and getting Calgarians back to work. It will create 20,000 jobs and provide $4.5 billion in stimulus spending at a time when it's needed most. Calgary faces one of the highest unemployment rates in the country and all the major banks predict our province will have one of the slowest economic recoveries in the country. Missing the construction deadline is a complete failure by the UCP. It fails to deliver on this government's promises of jobs and economic growth and worst of all, Mr. Speaker, it fails every single one of those 20,000 workers that would benefit from this project. Every day that passes without the construction start falls squarely at the feet of the UCP government, because this is a choice. Instead of creating 20,000 jobs and building an economic recovery for the city, this government chose to give billions of dollars for profitable corporations. And they chose to appease the wealthy special interests trying to kill this project. Meanwhile, they come up empty-handed for critical projects that will improve the lives of Calgarians. 
instead of ignoring Calgarians and taking them for granted, it's time for our government to start investing in Calgary's future. Let's get Calgarians back to work and build our economic recovery. Let's build the Green Line. The Honourable Member for Lacombe, Panoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to celebrate a true Made in Alberta success story with a deep connection to my riding. A couple of weeks ago, the Premier and Ministers of Energy and Environment joined Enhance Energy officials to celebrate a million tons of carbon captured and sequestered in central Alberta. Enhance Energy is sequestering CO2 at a rate equivalent to taking over 325,000 cars per year off the road. Their business captures carbon from the industrial heartland of Alberta, ships it down the Alberta carbon trunk line to Clive in my riding where it is sequestered. The oil produced by this refinery is some of the lowest emission product on the planet. Alberta has a capacity to do much more with carbon capture and sequestration and Enhance Energy and Alberta Company is leading the way. I'm proud of the great work Enhance is doing to reduce our carbon footprint while creating jobs. Enhance Energy has recently partnered with uh, Nodacol Energy to also capture up to 1 million tons of CO2 a year from Nodacol's planned blue methanol facility. Alberta's government supports industry and projects like this to protect lives and livelihood. That's why our province has asked the federal government for a substantial commitment to this technology, supporting the great work of companies like Enhance. This is Alberta's ingenuity at its finest, making our province our country and our world cleaner and safer and is creating jobs for hardworking and entrepreneurial Albertans. The federal government trumpets fighting climate change and investing in green technology, while my hope is that the federal government will actually act and invest in this project and others like it. Congratulations to the team at Enhance Energy and my sincere compliments to them on their megaton accomplishment. This is getting it done. The Honourable Member for Calgary Curry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you know, Calgary Curry is a wonderfully diverse and inclusive community, one where families and neighbours come together, mostly pre-COVID, of course, block parties happen, and for many areas, it's the local community association hall that serves as the heart of the community. I know firsthand from volunteering for years on the Richmond Knob Hill Development Committee that it doesn't matter how you vote, what you look like, who you love, or how you live, Everyone can come together at the community hall to serve the community, plan events, volunteer, and of course socialize. That is why it pains me to bring up the Glendale and Glendale Meadows community and what they have gone through. On January 26th of this year, the Glendale Community Hall experienced a catastrophic sewer backup that flooded the whole building. Perhaps worst of all, the newly restored preschool lost its home, and as a father of two, I can only imagine the problems and stresses that created for families in the community. Uh, I got the chance over the weekend to tour the structure, and it was heart-wrenching to see just how bad the damage is, along with the uh, you know, dealing with insurance uh, companies to, to help start the rebuild. The amazing volunteers are seeking grants from the province, the city of Calgary, and the federal government. One thing that struck me is that part-time volunteers have literally had to become full-time volunteers. Of course, the government of Alberta provides great supports like CFIP, the Community Facility Enhancement Program, and of course you can't have a balanced conversation about CFIP without including the Community Initiatives Program, which of course supports the Stabilize Program. I'll do everything I can to support these applications, and I encourage everyone in the community to get involved and help out however you can. So for more information, please go to www. Dot myglendale.ca. There will also likely be a local fundraising drive to support and rebuild. And when that ramps up, you'll be sure to be able to see it on my Instagram and Facebook. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to advise the Assembly pursuant to Standing Order 7 8 that daily routine can extend past 3 o'clock. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park has a statement to make. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the most horrific things that can occur in a relationship is domestic violence. Domestic violence is a family-shattering crime that affects many Canadians every year. Especially now, because during the COVID pandemic, domestic violence rates have unfortunately been on the rise. But Alberta's government has taken action by implementing a new law that will help prevent domestic violence before it can occur. On April 1st, Claire's law came into effect. 
Claire's law allows vulnerable Albertans who may be at risk for domestic violence to access relevant information about their romantic partners. This was one of our platform commitments, and our government is determined to provide support and protection for our vulnerable uh, citizens. The Ministries of Justice and Solicitor General and Community and Social Services have worked closely with our police partners to make sure a timely, manageable and thorough process is in place. This process ensures that we are striking the right balance between protecting those at risk, ensuring they are supported throughout the process and considering the privacy of the person whose information is being disclosed. Under the right to ask protocol, any they are a legal guardian or have a legal or have legal authority of the person. I am confident that this legislation will save lives by helping to prevent domestic violence and protect those who are at risk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Presenting reports by standing in special committees. Presenting petitions. Notices of motions. The Honourable Government House Leader, okay, followed by the Member for Edmonton, Glenora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to give oral notice of Bill 63, the Police Street Checks and Carding Amendment Act 2021, sponsored by the Minister of Justice. Bill 64, the Public Lands Amendment Act 2021, sponsored by myself. Bill 65, the Health Statutes Amendment Act 2021, sponsored by the Honourable Minister of Health. And lastly, Bill 66, the Public Health Amendment Act 2021, also sponsored by the Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Beg your indulgence. We'll go to the Honourable uh, Opposition House Leader, then the member of Edmonton Glenor. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise to give a oral notice of Bill 214, the Eastern Slopes Protection Act, on behalf of the member from Edmonton Strathcona, who is the bill sponsor. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Glenor. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise to give notice that at the appropriate time I intend to move the following motion. Be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge the government to listen to the concerns and voices of Albertans, educators and experts and delay the pilot of their draft K-6 curriculum until a broad consultation with staff, teachers, students, parents, curriculum experts and all Albertans is completed given the significant negative public response to the draft curriculum. Go ahead, we Introduction of bills, tabling returns and reports. Honourable members, are there tablings? Edmonton White Mud, followed by Glenora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, seek to table the requisite number of copies of 31 letters and emails sent by Albertans from across this province uh, representing our early childhood educators, child care operators, and parents who are requesting this government uh, maintain and expand the $25 per day uh, child care program as it has been life changing and transformational for them. Edmonton Glenora. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And later, uh, when we uh, hear the urgency for SO42, I intend to refer to a letter, so I'll table it today. Uh, it is from the Association of Alberta Deans of Education. Are there other tablings? Seeing none. Tablings to the Clerk. I wish to advise the Assembly that the following documents were deposited with the Office of the Clerk. On behalf of Honourable Mr. Shandro, Minister of Health, Pursuant to the Public Health Act, Public Health Appeal Board, 2020 Annual Report. Hospital Privileges Appeal Board, 2020 Annual Report. On behalf of Honourable Ms. Pawn, Minister of Seniors and Housing, supplemental response to a question raised by Ms. Renault, Honourable Member for St. Albert, March 17, 2021, Ministry of Seniors and Housing, 2021-22 Main Estimates Debate. Honourable Members, we will now hear the uh, Standing Order 42, as I believe this is the uh, initial opportunity for the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Glenora, uh, to raise a Standing Order 42. And as noted in her tabling, this is an opportunity to briefly explain the urgency of unanimous consent being granted for SO42, so I encourage you to stick to the urgency. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise uh, pursuant to SO42 request that ordinary business of the Legislative Assembly be adjourned as we debate uh, the motion that uh, has been now distributed. Um, specifically, uh, the motion refers to uh, the urgency of this. And I, I want to start by saying uh, that the motion reads, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge the government to listen to the concerns and voices of Albertans, 
educators, experts, and delay the pilot of the draft K-6 curriculum until a broad consultation with staff, teachers, students, parents, curriculum experts, and all Albertans is completed, given this significant negative public response to this draft curriculum. Today is the first day the House has sat, given that the uh, draft curriculum was released during the legislative uh, break, constituency week as it's referred to. Uh, this is urgent for the following reasons, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, I would say that the um, sharp and significant uprise of feedback that we have received in just uh, one week um, demonstrates that this is an urgent matter to the people of Alberta. They are calling on us to act quickly and to make decisive action. Uh, just earlier today, I checked how many school authorities had opted out of uh, this draft curriculum and we were already at five school districts, Mr. Speaker, two of the five being um, among the largest districts in our province, uh, number two and number four in terms of staff and in terms of students. There is significant concern being uh, raised by the people of Alberta, and uh, I imagine that all members have received this. I've received thousands of emails myself. I know the minister talked about a website to gather feedback. Uh, we also have a website gathering feedback, and the amount of original content, Mr. Speaker, um, this isn't a letter writing campaign that is a form letter. These are parents that have taken the time, uh, primarily parents, over the last uh, year. They've gotten to know the current curriculum that their children are learning exceptionally well, many through the remote home learning process. Uh, and they have raised a number of significant concerns. Um, as well, Mr. Speaker, more than 30,000 people have joined Albertans Reject Draft Curriculum Facebook group that was launched just one week ago. And now we're seeing a rush of boards and, and other large organizations, including the Francophone Association, uh, calling on the government to halt this curriculum. This has all happened just in the last week, Mr. Speaker. This is the first sitting day. Um, huge concerns have been raised, specifically around um, grade six and grade two content. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, to put it quite simply, this is about the foundation of knowledge for all Alberta students. This is about making sure that what we prepare them for in K through six gives them a strong foundation for secondary education, um, grade seven through 12, as well as for post-secondary education, the world of work, and for being uh, engaged citizens in democracy. The original curriculum process began uh, under um, then education minister, uh, David Hancock, and this was something that was continued on until um, the, uh, the current government uh, decided to uh, halt that process completely. Uh, metaphorically put it through the shredder and uh, launch a new curriculum. And the public uh, response to that, Mr. Speaker, has been uh, astounding. Um, when the Premier spoke uh, of this matter uh, late last week, he said that there was overwhelming support. Mr. Speaker, I have seen the contrary through the correspondence that I've received, through people stopping me on the street, and I imagine many other members of as well. Having a difficult time uh, connecting some of the public response to the urgency of the debate in the House. I encourage you to speak specifically to the urgency uh, and not debate the content of the motion, which I think that we are certainly heading in the direction of. I appreciate your caution, Mr. Speaker. So uh, while uh, such a, a loud and rapid response has been received, this is absolutely the first sitting day that this assembly is together since it was introduced. The uh, large number of correspondence that we've received during that constituency week, I think, is a symbol uh, to all members of this assembly that this is a matter of concern for your constituents, for my constituents, for all Albertans. And I think uh, it would uh, demonstrate that we uh, are, indeed have our earplugs out, that we are listening to the people of Alberta, that we're not continuing to recite uh, talking points that were written a week ago and that we are receiving the information and we're responding in a rapid way, Mr. Speaker. So, but uh, if, that's, if that's the case, I'm happy to hear it. The Honourable Member, uh, well, I, I appreciate it. it's a long-standing tradition in this House, though not one that's accepted to try to debate an item when one's supposed to be limited to talking to the reason for urgency. The Member's now drifted once pretty far that way. You warned the Member and the Member's drifted there again. I, I know the Member, we all try to sneak in debate when we're supposed to be talking urgency, but it might be time to ask the Member to stick to the issue of urgency. I'm not sure if the member of Glenora, Edmonton Glenora, has any further comments with respect to urgency, but I will interject if they aren't. 
So I therefore request, given the significant volume, the amount of short time, and the fact that this is the first sitting day, that this is an urgent matter, that Albertans have spoken very publicly, very quickly, and that they expect their government and their Legislative Assembly representatives to respond also in an urgent matter and address this uh, as promptly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Members, under pursuant to Standing Order 42, this is a non-debatable request for unanimous consent which no other member can speak to. So I will ask only one question. Is there anyone opposed to providing unanimous consent? If so, indicate now. Opposed. Unanimous consent is not granted and the business of the day will not be set aside. And as such, we're at orders of the day, orders de jour. Under government bills and orders for second reading, Bill 54, Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021, adjourned debate, Honourable Mr. Dreeshen. Honourable members, before the Assembly, Bill 54, Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021, at second reading, the Honourable the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry has 12 minutes remaining to speak, should he choose to use it. Seeing not, is there others? The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. <coughs> Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so I rise on Bill 54, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act, uh, second reading. And, you know, I want, I want to be clear with, with all members of the House. We've had lots of conversations, and, and I've been consulting with, with many of our producers in southern Alberta. And recognize that, you know, this bill is important for two reasons. Um, one is to ensure that the irrigation districts are able to have their plebiscides when they need to, to be able to develop their boards. But the more significant uh, change and, and the reason for this bill is, is to support and allow the irrigation districts to take on opponents of uh, an amount of debt so that they can take the loan from the CAP program with the federal government. Now we know out of the $815 million that is being um, put aside for irrigation, that the majority of that eight, $850 million is actually coming from the federal government. And it's coming from the federal government in the sense of a loan, not through a grant or um, any type of other ability to access it. And so because of that, um, the irrigation districts need to then be able to take on that debt. And prior to this piece of legislation being introduced, that was not something that could happen. So it's, it's pretty much a, a, a housekeeping bill, and I appreciate that that, that that is what it is. There are some things that I think, had the minister decided to spend some more time on the piece of legislation, he could have addressed some of the other pieces that the irrigation districts are, are discussing. I have some concerns about the fact that the legislation is outdated and that you know there there are pieces within the legislation as a whole that do create some barriers for the irrigation districts to do the work that they need to do um, one of those barriers would be advertising and making sure that communities are aware that when maintenance to irrigation canals or expansion of those areas are being done that they notify the surrounding communities right now the legislation only allows that to be done in writing that made sense when the bill was written because, of course, um, that was when newspapers were all small communities, all small towns had newspapers and you could put it in the newspaper and the community read it. Now, as we've seen the world change, we have social media and online tools. Many of those small community papers no longer exist. And so the notification requirements around letting, making sure that people are aware of what's happening have changed. And I know the irrigation districts would like that reflected in the legislation, and I recognize that that wasn't done um, within this piece of legislation. I'm assuming and, and may believe that that's coming at some point, but I won't predispose or pre-oppose or whatever that the government's going to actually do that. The other piece that I think is, is um, really important to look at with this is that we know the irrigation is... Um, a tool that is very important to southern Alberta. Without irrigation, most of the crops would suffer because it's so hot and dry down there. 
That's why we're able to grow sugar beets and create sugar. That's why we're able to grow pulses and grains and potatoes and all the great things that, that happens in Alberta. Now, of course, with irrigation comes water because that is the main purpose of irrigation. And I think that there's, there are some legitimate concerns that have been brought up um, in regards to what is happening in Southern Alberta, specifically when we look at if irrigation is going to be expanded and we're going to be supporting the agricultural industry to build those or grow those wonderful products that they're growing and, and see hopefully diversification and expansion through other industries like the potato uh, area with Cavendish um, and hopefully we'll see some pulse diversification. If at any point the water becomes contaminated, the irrigation canals and the irrigation system doesn't mean anything. Now, I have heard, and I think that I'd like to hear from the government, is that even with coal, and, and we've heard the minister say this a few times in regards to, um, oh, well, the, the water allocation hasn't changed, um, the Old Man River is not going to be impacted. That's what the minister says. But what I'm hearing from producers is actually the water, water monitoring in itself has been impacted. And in fact, if we look at the budget for both the Ministry of Environment as well as the Ministry of Agriculture, those positions, those staff that were doing uh, water monitoring were actually terminated. Those positions no longer exist. So the outcome of that water monitoring is actually been put on the irrigation districts who are now having to pay to get their water monitored. And now I'm hearing other uh, groups of our producers who are now also going to be paying to get their water monitored because they can't guarantee that the ministry will send someone out to test that water. So they're now going to have to pay to have someone come out and test it and then send it to a private lab to get the certifications that they need. Which is a problem because I believe that water is a common good. I believe that we want to make sure that we have good, clean water in this province. We know that the irrigation canals are not just about growing, product, or growing produce. Um, we also know that, they are the, that the irrigation canals are the main water provider for Lethbridge, for Medicine Hat, for surrounding communities that use the irrigation system to provide drinking water. And to hear that there has been a move that now producers are going to have to get their water tested um, and do it themselves to ensure that the water is uh, meeting the quality and the standards that are required by uh, the Canadian food regulator, I think is a problem. And it should be a problem for all citizens because it's also their drinking water. And so I would like to hear from the minister around whether it be the Minister of Environment, which is ultimately responsible for water, but you know, the Minister of Agriculture could also stand up and comment on this, um, is how are we ensuring that the water quality is being maintained and where is that being done and where's the record of the last test that was done on our water, especially from the Old Man River? Because again, $815 million can be put into an investment, which is only really, to be clear, $274 million from the province. The rest is a loan from the federal government. But if the irrigation water becomes contaminated, if we start seeing invasive species growing in the pipes, um, or you know, we start seeing that we have uh, seepage happening from coal mine exploration, then, there, then there's a problem. So that's fine. You know, supporting the bill in the context of the housekeeping required to support um, the ability to take on debt and the irrigation canals to take or irrigation communities and districts to take on the debt for the CIB program, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank is fine. But there's a lot more questions that are related to irrigation that we haven't actually heard from this government. And I think they're legitimate questions that Albertans are continuously bringing up around the quality of their water in southern Alberta. So I'd like to hear that from the minister. The other piece that I think is also important is we've heard the minister stand up quite a few times talking about how great the agricultural industry has been doing in Alberta. And thankfully, 
Red Deer South has had a great year when it comes to agriculture. Um, grain, cereals, pulses, all of the commodities have definitely been able to um, put, carry us through the pandemic in the sense of generating some economic growth and, and giving some good return for the investment that farmers are putting in every day to, to grow these products. But what we also haven't heard the minister recognize or even address is what's going on between, for Red Deer North. So we talk about irrigation and how important water is for producers in the south and these great, this great announcement about, you know, expanding the irrigation network. We hear nothing about how we're going to support the farmers in northern Alberta. And what I can tell you is every time the minister decides to make a comment about how great agriculture is doing in grain, I hear from northern Alberta farmers saying, well, my fields all failed last year. I got flooded out. There was too much moisture in the soil. There's still too much moisture in the soil. We were having our, um, everything was eroding, and so we couldn't even seed, and if we did seed, well, it all just, it all eroded down the hill anyway. So my question is, is, you know, $850 million, 60, per, 60 of that's from the feds, $270 million from the province for irrigation canals and expansion of irrigation networks, but yet nothing has been invested by this government into infrastructure for the north. And those farmers deserve support too. You know, I would, I would like to see the government come forward and talk about a plan that they, and a vision that they have for Northern Alberta farmers that includes some of this uh, money or goes back to the feds and says we need more for CIB, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. We need them to invest some more and bring some more money to Northern Alberta. We need to look at tiling or we need to look at different strategies that work to help the water filter and run off these, these uh, crops and these fields without contaminating the water in the north. And it can happen. We see the research. Norway's doing it. They've got lots of options in Norway because they have, they have the same kind of issues with climate. So, you know, we're, we're watching right now to look at what's happening. And I've done a couple farm tours in the last little bit, uh, obviously COVID compliant. And they're, they're watching as well to see what their fields are going to look like in northern Alberta. Because they don't know. There's still snow on many of them. But I can tell you, last year was a very, very hard year. And to see this government talking about not supporting all of agri-stability, not to be looking at all of the different other options for farmers, um, and focusing solely on irrigation as being the big success story of this government. And look, what, look what's happened. There's $274 million being put in to an irrigation plan that really is only happening because the feds are putting in 60% of it. Because um, I don't think it would happen if they didn't. And ignoring the rest of the province um, is pretty sad. I mean, it's Red Deer North, ignoring all of Northern Alberta. And on top of that too, looking at the fact that, you know, I want to go back again to quality of water, is that if we don't have these certificates, which for some reason the government's not testing the water, I don't know why that is, those certificates are used for international sale. Many of our producers show that certificate to say our water quality is so good in southern Alberta, we have the best products, we have the best potatoes, we have the best pulses, we have the best sugar beets um, in southern Alberta because we have such amazing water quality. And they get a little certificate with a stamp on it and they get to show that to who they sell their products to. And that's great for international trade and to celebrate the industry and to really um, support the work that's happening and in fact have investment come into the province because the quality is, the product is so good that to diversify it here and to do all of those things, it's a great selling feature. And so my question again to the government would be, Where's that certificate? Who's going to be providing that certificate? Typically, it's a Government of Alberta certificate. Water is great stamp. Um, but because we now have different producing, producer groups having to get their own water tested, and they're having to pay. So this is the thing, right, is that the irrigation districts are having to have to pay to get their own water tested when that used to be done by the province because the staff don't exist anymore. So this is just another one of those examples where the downloading of costs is on the consumer. 
and on Albertan because water, especially with our irrigation systems, because it's the municipality's drinking water in Medicine Hat and in Lethbridge and all of these places, um, there's a fee attached to that. And of course that fee is gonna get downloaded on the citizens of these, these um, cities and towns and counties because that's how they get their water. And so, and it's quite a substantial fee um, from what I understand for one test. It's in the uh, tens of thousands of dollars for just one test. And of course that's, that's only one area and you know, there's other things. And, and the other part about the water testing too for these areas is that if it's not done by the province, and the certificate is not provided, then for some reason, and I mean, this is a, an interesting red tape solution that I would love the government to take on. If the water's not tested in Alberta, then they'll just look at similar farming practices in another province and they'll use that water. And they'll say, well, if it's, if it's being farmed the same way in Ontario with the same outcome and, and the same product, um, and they're producing pulses there, well, we'll just take their water sample, and if their water sample's fine, then it's fine. Um, but if there's a problem in Ontario with their water, and we don't test on our, our water here in Alberta, then all of a sudden the Alberta producers are having to respond to an issue in water that actually has nothing to do with Alberta. But because the water testing hasn't happened, and there's no verification from the province, that's for some reason how it works. So the best practice would be is that the government, the province, whether it be environment and parks, and ideally agriculture, would test the water and then we wouldn't have these issues. And we've seen this in the egg industry. And I'm sure many of the colleagues in here know this. When there was a issue with eggs in Ontario, with salmonella, it impacted the Alberta market. Because then they had to go through extra testing for their eggs because they had to prove that they didn't have the salmonella issue that Ontario was having, even though we're provinces and provinces and provinces apart, it's all part of the same supply chain. So again, although this bill is fine, and I don't think there's any reason why we wouldn't support it, it doesn't actually talk about any of the other issues that it relates to agriculture and supports farmers, or relates to diversification of our industry, or relates to water monitoring, or you know, coral, coal expo exploration in the south, the, the issues that farmers and ranchers are coming forward with around their concerns around their, the southern Alberta and the southern slopes. It doesn't address or look at investing any money into helping farmers in the north. What point, of order? point of order has been called. I see the Honourable Minister for Transportation and Municipal Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and while I'm enjoying very much the, uh, the debates and commentary of the Honourable Member, um, there is a, uh, uh, under uh, 23L, um, introduces a matter in debate that offends the practices and precedences of the assembly. And one of the practices and precedences that this offends, Mr. Speaker, is that people generally are required to speak somewhat about the bill that is being debated. And, and while, while the, the member has wandered far and wide into a, I would say a litany and a grocery list of things that the honorable member might rather discuss, and. The Honourable Member's preferences are not my concern. My only concern is that you perhaps remind the Honourable Member that to uh, spend some time at least debating the bill which is before this House. Thank you. I am prepared to rule, but I see the Honourable Opposition House Leader has risen. Mr. Speaker, uh, 23L. Uh, in response to the remarks I was just listening to from my colleague from Edmonton Manning, uh, this is not a point of order. We are currently in second reading. The member is eloquently responding to uh, the bill, the general subjects of the bill, and general subjects relating to it. Uh, that the government deputy house leader uh, finds that this offends the practices and precedents of the assembly uh, I completely disagree with, and I think this is in practice with how uh, debate around a new piece of legislation takes place. And it's my suggestion to you this is not a point of order, and that the member is being very relevant and on topic at this time. Based on the submissions, I think that it is fair to say that this is not a matter of debate, or sorry, that this is not a point of order, and that it is a matter of debate in the sense that 
Uh, often we have afforded a wide swath with regards to, uh, especially um, when individuals have a first opportunity to speak on a bill. So I would ask the Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning to please continue with about 3.45 left, should she choose to take it. <coughs> Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, I, I do appreciate that coal and water monitoring is a little bit of a sore point, but um, the reality of it is, is that it will significantly impact the irrigation districts. Mm -hmm. Significantly. $815 million is a lot of money to be putting forward to expand only eight, to be clear, of the 13 irrigation canals that are registered for this program. And all of them are in southern Alberta. All of them somehow are interconnected to the Old Man River which then is where the majority of Albertans are standing up to, and we're hearing from them very, very clearly that they're worried about coal exploration, they're worried about contamination of their water, they're worried about their drinking water, and all of that runs through our irrigation system. So it's very much related to this bill because it relates to a huge financial investment by this province that is not putting the safety measures in place to protect the very system. I mean. Yep, that, that's coal. We could talk about invasive species and the fact that, you know, we know that mussels are an issue in this province and getting into our fresh water. And we've got our, our lovely canines that inspect our boats and we're looking and trying to stop people from coming across the border um, and making sure that they're not, you know, using their, their uh, boats where they're not supposed to. But invasive species are also an issue for the irrigation canal because if the mussels get into the system they can basically clog up clog up a pipe so that is very related to irrigation um, systems and again that is also part of the monitoring system and to make sure that the minister of environment and the, and the ministry in itself is ensuring that those invasive species are not getting into our fresh water system and potentially damaging and causing huge damage to the irrigation system is important. Um, so water is what irrigation is. Like the whole, the whole intention of the irrigation system is to ensure that we put water on our crops and that when we have really dry seasons that you know, our producers can continue to produce. So I think I find it a little bit rich when the government says it's that water monitoring and making sure that we don't have issues around our southern slopes in Alberta and contamination of our water doesn't relate to this bill. Because I don't know what else they want to put through it unless the plan is to, you know, take over these pipes and put oil through them. I think the water part's pretty important. And the producers care about it. And in fact, out of anything, that is what they're talking about. The investment is great, but it only works if the water's clean. So, um, I appreciate that it's a touchy subject, but the reality is, is that it is the subject. So, um, let's see, what else can I, facts can I give you today? Um, so I think some of the important things that the honorable uh, government members might want to also consider is that Alberta has more than 1.7 million uh, irrigation acres that generates $2.4 billion in annual labor income and supports 56,000 jobs. That's a lot of people working in southern Alberta who may lose their jobs if the water becomes contaminated by coal and uh, will significantly impact the southern Alberta economy because $2 billion in annual sales accounts for about 18% of the total provincial food processing sales. So that's a lot. Irrigation uh, contributes to $3.6 billion in Alberta's gross domestic product. Thank you, Honourable Members. I see the Honourable Member for Calgary East has risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to express my support for Bill 54, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act. I would like to thank the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry and all the staff for their hard work in developing this legislation. This bill will improve our irrigation industry, which is a vital part of Alberta's economy. It will also contribute in the transformation of the agriculture sector, immensely improve its efficiency. Agriculture has a strong history in Alberta, and without it, we would not be where we are today. Alberta's rural communities provide, provided huge contributions in building our province and their land work 
has benefited Albertans for over 100 years. Many rural workers over the past century were, like myself, immigrants to Alberta with years of experience working, working in agriculture. Their hard work made our province what it is today. Now in the 21st century, our province enjoys the advantage of modern technology with roots almost literally in practice that began decades ago. Irrigation is one such practice that has been established in the agriculture industry for a very long time. The irrigation industry is a vital component of Alberta's agriculture sector, and it always has been for well over 100 years. It has created tens of thousands of jobs and brought prosperity to Albertans. Today, not only does it make up a significant portion of the agriculture and food industry, but every year the irrigation industry also contributes 3.6 billion to Alberta's GDP. Mr. Speaker, this is a significant number, but there are even more ways this sector contributes to Alberta's economy. Currently, the irrigation industry is a prom promising place to invest for the future. Investors can accept a return of almost 300%. Mr. Speaker, I am sure that this is due in large part of the organizational structure that ensured in the early 1900s. Since the 1915 Irrigation Districts Act was passed, landowners have taken the opportunity to organize themselves into districts, now a total of 13, and to better represent their needs to the government through their own boards of directors. Having the ability to represent themselves and advocate for their own industry has allowed these irrigation districts more control over their own development. These districts continue to make significant contributions to our lives and livelihoods. Mr. Speaker, in recognition of the importance of this sector, we wanted to ensure continued success in the irrigation industry. Last year, the government announced the Alberta Recovery Plan with historic $815 million investment in irrigation district infrastructure. This investment was due in part to government grants, a loan from the Canadian Infrastructure Bank, and the combined investment of 163 million from eight irrigation districts. These funds will serve to modernize this sector while at the same time increasing water storage capacity at this site. It will also bring up to 8,080 jobs to Albertans, directly and indirectly, many of them in the field of construction. However, Mr. Speaker, in order to ensure this funding was allocated to the districts, necessary changes have to be made to the Irrigation Districts Act, which has now been introduced by Bill 54. Without this investment, irrigation districts would have a much harder time planning large-scale projects. The bill will in remove uncertainties in the act and introduce clarity that will allow Alberta's irrigation industry to borrow funds from large-scale projects that would see a major boost to Alberta's recovery. The amendments that the bill introduces is in the accordance with the condition that was outlined by the Canada Infrastructure Bank, or CIB, prior to releasing the funding. The CIB required that the proper clarification must be made regarding commercial activities. Unless the same is made, CIB can term terminate the credit agreement and cancel the loan, with, which represents 50% of the total projects. Bill 54 seeks to provide this explicit clarification that the term commercial activities does not apply to an irrigation district investing in its own irrigation works. Moreover, if unchanged, these uncertainties had the potential to cause a number of problems and create a negative impact on investment in irrigation districts because the language is unclear regarding what was considered commercial activity in the Act. This meant that investors must more hesitant to lend money to irrigation districts. 
That is why this is an important matter we need to address, Mr. Speaker. We need to make it easier and more feasible to invest in the agriculture industry. This in industry has always made up a vital portion of Alberta's economy, and it will continue to do for generations to come. Having said that, it is that much more significant that we make investment in, in agriculture as simple and clear as possible. By clarifying this language, we will be providing every opportunity for expansion in the, in the agriculture industry. Given the historic contributions of this industry to Alberta, it is only fitting that we make our vital investments into irrigation districts and make improvements to the existing legislation. This is so much important given our current economic situation and our need to recover from the economic downturn Alberta have faced. Inviting more investment to Alberta's agriculture is just one more way we can do that to continue to protect the lives and livelihoods of Albertans, particularly those who are em employed in the irrigation industry. This bill will also address similar problems that some irrigation districts have pointed out in regards to improving the governance of their boards. Part of the democratic process in involves guaranteeing accountability to decision makers. This applies to all levels of governance. This particular example is significant because in the past, some districts have expressed the need to limit the consecutive terms of the board members. Mr. Speaker, Bill 54 will provide the option to limit the terms of sitting board members, which is in turn give the chance of new board members to be part of the board and will allow Albertans the opportunity to bring exciting new ideas and proposals forward and to give irrigation districts more chances to hear from people of diverse backgrounds. This is nothing new, Mr. Speaker, as these kinds of term limits are common across kind of board governance. Currently, there is low turnover rate in irrigation districts board. Increasing accountability through board term limits will give these districts more leeway and freedom with the decision making, so they won't be held back by stagnant ideas. Mr. Speaker, we want to encourage new ideas and fresh perspective. That is what this legislation does. It provides the chance of, for investment, funding, jobs, and accountability across the irrigation districts. It increases the confidence and investors can have in the industry. By increasing this confidence and clarifying the language in this legislation, we'll be opening up more opportunities for funding from our government. Mr. Speaker, this funding will greatly increase the efficiency of the sector through projects designed to boost the industry. Our government expects that these projects will generate around 430 million in our GDP every year. Mr. Speaker, this will not come at a better time. Not only that we are improving the irrigation districts through this funding by opening up investment opportunities, but we are also doing the same for our province. Our province needs this agriculture industry. Alberta was built through the hard work of farmers and rural workers. Now we have the opportunity to show our appreciation for this industry by introducing legislation that will improve its efficiency and productivity. That is why I fully support Bill 54, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act, and I encourage all the members of this House to support this bill as well. Let me again express my appreciation to the Minister and all the staff of the Ministry for making these changes possible towards a better future of Alberta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member. 29-2A is available for short questions or comments. See none. Are there any members looking to join debate? I see the Honourable Member for West Henday, Edmonton West Henday. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise today to speak to Bill 54, Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021. And uh, I've appreciated the comments that we've heard thus far in, in the debate. And thank you um, in particular to uh, the 
the member from Edmonton Manning for raising uh, some of our main concerns here in the opposition when we look at this legislation. And as um, was mentioned by that member, we do, uh, as far as I can tell, plan to support uh, Bill 54, but we, we do have concerns. And when we look at what's included in this legislation, it's important to recognize that irrigation is, is no doubt an important industry and supporting and investing in agriculture is necessary for supporting the diversification and the investments that we hope to see in Alberta. And, and no doubt this sector has become even more important as um, we see the global price of oil falling and we look to other sectors to uh, continue the important work of supporting our economy. And so when we uh, look at the idea of, of supporting agriculture through um, investments in irrigation districts and irrigation systems. No doubt it's something that uh, I think we, we will see broad support for from uh, all members in, in the legislature as well as the general public. Uh, but once again, as, as the member from Edmonton Manning raised on, on this piece of legislation, there are questions that uh, we don't have answers for at this point and so we hope to hear from the minister moving forward. And uh, it's also important to address once again that when we look at the investments that are proposed um, uh, through previous announcements and, and through the um, uh, creation of this legislation that uh, the majority of that funding is coming from the federal government and so we have to appreciate that uh, in some respects it does seem like uh, if it wasn't for the federal government in this instance uh, supporting us through the, um, the, the um, infrastructure bank that we may not be seeing these investments in the first place but uh, I will point out that I'm thankful to see uh, these investments moving forward and thankful to see the federal government uh, supporting Alberta through this process and, and the fact is when we look at uh, other areas of partnership or opportunities for partnership between the, the province of Alberta and the federal government. Unfortunately, uh, this UCP government has been slow to taking up that support, uh, specifically, specifically when we look at the uh, critical worker benefit. The fact is we were in here just two weeks ago laying out the fact that the provincial government had no real plan to administer this money and because of that it was very likely that federal dollars were going to uh, be removed from the table. And so uh, yet to see how exactly that is going to play out, but the fact is this government had more than a year to, to come to an agreement with the federal government and really uh, the lack of, of movement from the provincial government really went to show in that instance how little they at least appeared to care about ensuring frontline support uh, or frontline workers across the province were getting that funding. But once again, Mr. Speaker, Thankfully, in this instance, uh, we, we finally see this legislation moving forward and supports for the irrigation districts across the province. Uh, I believe it was um, relatively late or maybe mid-2020 when we saw some of these announcements being made. And so uh, to see it moving forward is, is an important step, uh, I would say, in the right direction overall. Uh, once again, there's, there's concerns that we have that aren't addressed through this legislation and uh, we will get to that and as the member from Edmonton Manning spoke uh, to some of those issues, they, they continue to be concerns for us, uh, specifically with the environmental record of uh, this UCP government and even looking back to some of the decisions uh, that the uh, ministries have made in terms of funding for their portfolios and funding for their ministries, when we look at um, uh, agriculture and forestry, uh, the ministry has been completely devastated by cuts from this UCP government. And uh, when, we, when we think about uh, the last budget and looking at this budget, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that this is a government that primarily is, is coming from rural communities because it does not show through their priorities and their commitments to funding for uh, important parts of our, of our society and important parts of our industry. Uh, when we look at the funding cuts that happened uh, in agriculture and forestry, it was disproportionately affected compared to other ministries. Absolutely devastated, whether it was through um, research funding uh, or, or jobs in the ministry um, or funding for, for colleges and universities across the province who focused on this important work. And, and not only through that ministry, but also when we look at uh, the decision to make major cuts at Alberta Innovates. In, in last year's budget, we saw an $89 million cut to Alberta Innovates. Uh, in, in this budget, we saw uh, a, a small 
piece of that money return to Alberta Innovates, but the fact is when we look at the important work that Alberta Innovates is doing, whether it's uh, potentially some marketing, whether it's product research or um, value-added processing, moving, moving those opportunities forward, they do invaluable work and it, it goes to show um, whether we are once again talking about value-added processing, whether we are talking about the expansion of, of pulse crops in our province and the opportunities that uh, lie there. But when we see major, in, uh, major cuts to these important programs, it really contradicts the messaging of the UCP and it, it really contradicts um, the message that we should be sending as a province to try and bring new people uh, in, new investors, new corporations and companies uh, to support our province. And, you know, when we look at the cuts, whether it's to Alberta Innovates or um, some of the cuts that we saw last year to uh, the Lethbridge Research Centre, for example, which uh, was the district office for Alberta agriculture, or is the uh, district office for Alberta Ag agriculture and the Crop Diversification Centre south in Brooks, Alberta. Uh, last year, a short time ago, we saw an undisclosed number of employees lose their jobs at that facility. And they, once again, are focused on things like research, ensuring that moving forward the technologies are in place or that we're um, understanding what the future of the industry holds for our province and, and trying to stay ahead of any, any hurdles or circumstances that might be on the horizon. And so when we see massive cuts to programs like that in, in research uh, or any other uh, piece of the sector, it's very concerning. And, uh, articles were written about that, uh, the job losses at that research facility, and it was very clear that some of these uh, research opportunities that were, were being undertaken and have now potentially been cut or lost, those are things that we won't necessarily uh, see for several years, possibly a decade from now, uh, the full extent of the damage that this government has caused by cutting positions at that research centre or in their ministry altogether. And so, once again, while we're thankful to see the provincial government finally, you know, um, doing something positive in terms of a relationship with the federal government, the fact is, when we look at the decisions of, of the ministers and the, the cuts to their ministries, it's quite opposite uh, from the story that they're telling to Albertans and how much they care about our, our rural communities and how much they care about um, investments in those communities, whether it's in agriculture, in forestry, or any other sector. Now, uh, once again, when we look at the $815 million uh, moving forward, um, proposed moving forward, we see the federal government taking on a 60% of that, uh, the provincial government uh, providing 40% of that, and so still, uh, we have the provincial government, you know, not even willing to commit the same level of support as our federal government. But at the end of the day, this $815 million investment is, is definitely important. Now, uh, as I alluded to earlier, there's, there's concerns that we see in this legislation or, or concerns about what is missing within this legislation. Um, the fact is there was many requests for additional changes to this bill that are not included here. I believe that um, if, if a bit more time potentially or uh, more efficiently used for consultation, we may have seen some more suggestions from the industry actually implemented through this legislation, which is uh, relatively unfortunate. Um, you know, once again, the, the member from Edmonton Manning and the critic on this important file raised several times our concerns around uh, contamination of our water from coal, and stakeholders have come forward in, in great numbers to raise their concerns around this. One of, you know, probably in terms of how much feedback we're getting, one of the most important issues to communities especially who have uh, water sources and irrigation that are going to be affected by the proposed changes um, or um, the proposed uh, coal facilities moving forward, which is greatly concerning. Uh, once again, why are only eight out of the 13 irrigation canals registered for this program? What, what happened to the rest of them? Why aren't they included is, is a concern that was brought up by my colleague from Edmonton Manning. Uh, when we look at the policy changes that are being provided in here, uh, two major policy changes, one that it provides an exemption to commercial activity in the Act, and two gives irrigation districts the power to create bylaws regarding term limits for directors. 
Now, the exemption to commercial activities is being added to the Irrigation Districts Act to provide clarity around uh, how that money is going to roll out and due to uh, a lot of the restrictions regarding debt limits for irrigation districts, um, this change has to be made. And so we can understand that and appreciate that um, there is a lot of um, things that have to be done to move this money forward and, and we can appreciate that and, and support uh, those decisions of the provincial government to move uh, forward with that through this piece of legislation and so that's that's an important change that we're seeing but once again you know when we consider um, the loss of of jobs and the loss of of um, resources and the loss of research opportunities uh, that we're seeing across the province, whether it's in the ministry itself, whether it's in uh, Alberta Innovates, whether it's at the Lethbridge Research Centre, it's, it's, it's quite frightening. And, and we've seen this from, from previous Conservative governments. Uh, when I think back to uh, the term of, of um, the federal Conservatives and their absolute attacks on on scientists, on researchers, on anyone that might question the motive of their government. It seems like we're seeing a very similar playbook um, moving forward here in our province and it's very concerning. It's very concerning because it seems that this government is, is willing to cut the jobs and attack anyone that is, is willing to speak critically against this UCP government and it's, it's unfortunate. Not only from a, a perspective of ensuring that we are able to bring new investments to the province and that we are ensuring that the research is, is being done to understand uh, what is on the horizon, but it's unfortunate that a government would even come to the table without having all of the best experts uh, there at the table with them. And so, once again, we, we see some major concerns in the legislation. We have major concerns about what we see as a, a lack of, of um, importance placed on water, water monitoring from this provincial government. You know, currently the irrigation districts must pay for their water monitoring. Uh, and with the changes, once again, that we're seeing to coal, there is increased concerns that water monitoring will have to be done more frequently. But the fact is the government is going in the opposite direction through this legislation and other um, moves that we've seen from this government. We're seeing the exact opposite where there's a greater expectation put on whether it's corporations to do that monitoring themselves, whether it's municipalities uh, or other uh, towns and councils and counties. Once again, we are seeing that important work being um, downloaded onto municipalities and other stakeholders, which really seems to, be, uh, seems to be the game and the plan of this provincial government, this UCP government, is to download as much as they can onto other orders of government or other uh, orders of society and then come back and say, well, we're not sure why you can't handle it, even though we cut all of your funding and, and told you you have to do all this work yourself. So it's very unfortunate. But thankfully, in this instance, uh, the federal government has, has come to the table and expressed their interest in bringing new investment to the province of Alberta. And thankfully, the provincial government has, has moved forward and is not going to let this money sit on the table or, or be taken off the table from a lack of movement uh, and a lack of consultation. And so thankfully, we're seeing uh, what we have here in Bill 54, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021. And at this point, uh, once again, I, I'm prepared to support this, but it's, it's unfortunate that we're seeing um, many of the other changes uh, and, and, and missed opportunities from this UCP government. So with that, uh, I will take my seat, Mr. Speaker, but I appreciate the opportunity to rise to speak to this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. 29-2A is available. See none. Are there any members looking to join debate? I see the Honourable Member for Cardson Siksika has risen. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise today to speak on this Bill 54, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act. Uh, I'm actually very grateful that I'm hearing members from the NDP caucus speak on this bill. Uh, you know, I, I, I always appreciate hearing their opinion on any subject matter. This one is in particularly interesting because they are showing such an interest in what farmers and ranchers have to say I wish they had shared that kind of moxie for what they had to say back when they were doing their so-called consultation on Bill 6. But with that said, I'm grateful to hear that they're willing to support such a great piece of legislation. 
Mr. Speaker. I would also like to thank the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry for bringing, the, bringing this bill forward and making the necessary legislation that will provide clarity to irrigation districts. Irrigation districts and infrastructure in Alberta are vital to our economy and influences the economic, social, and environmental well-being of the region and provides great value for the province of Alberta, particularly in my area of Cardston Siksika. The 8,000 kilometres of canals and pipelines and 57 water storage reservoirs convey water to the arid region of southern Alberta. This provides water and food production, communities, businesses, wildlife, and wetlands and recreation opportunities. The irrigation industry contributes $3.6 billion annually to Alberta's GDP, which represents about 20% of the agri-food sector GDP and only 4.7% of the pro on only 4.7% of the province's cultivated land. As the irrigation industry is so vital to our economy, it is important that we have legislation that meets the needs there. The current Irrigation Districts Act have been, uh, have been giving issues to the irrigation districts. This is because of the ambiguity regarding what constitutes a commercial activity which creates risk that impacts financial institutions that are willing to lend funds to the irrigation districts. Mr. Speaker, without these funds, irrigation districts are unable to have large-scale projects to build or maintain irrigation networks. Bill 54 will mitigate these issues. By resolving this issue, it will sat satisfy final conditions associated with the near nearly billion-dollar infrastructure deal that was announced in October. And while I'm speaking on that just for a moment, I would again like to express my sincere gratitude to the government for investing in Southern Alberta. Governments talk about investing quite often, and I think the federal government often uses that word a bit too loosely. But when you're talking about irrigation and investment, a number of the irrigation district presidents and those who use the water in the irrigation districts will tell you that has almost a three to one ratio of return on investment. True investment in Southern Alberta something Southern Alberta has been asking for, something that they're getting, and it's a commitment that this government has made to Southern Alberta to ensure that they are not left off the discussion table, that they are being thought of regularly. It's what I was elected to do as the member for Cardston Siksika, something that I have continually spoken with the Minister of Agriculture about, just generally the needs of agriculture in Southern Alberta. And I'm grateful that he has listened. I'm grateful the Premier has listened. But this deal that I just spoke about is expected to create up to 6,800 direct and indirect permanent jobs and 1,280 construction jobs. As a result, irrigated area is expected to increase by up to 200,000 acres, a 15% increase across the eight irrigation districts without increasing the overall water allocation. That is substantial, Mr. Speaker. It will also enable future transactions for projects which are expected to generate more than 430 million in provincial GDP. The irrigation industry is a vital part of Alberta's economy and will be well into the future. These legislative changes will allow Alberta's irrigation industry to borrow funds for large scale projects that would be a major boost for Alberta's economic recovery. We have seen that the agriculture has been, rather that agriculture has been a leader in Alberta's economic recovery, especially throughout the COVID pandemic, when a lot of other industries were hurting financially. These men and women who work in agriculture continue to put one foot in front of the other, get up every day, feed the province, and they feed the country. To them, I am very grateful. Agriculture has and will continue to be an important part of Alberta's economic recovery now and in the future. By changing this legislation to be more flexible for Alberta's irrigation industry to borrow funds for large-scale irrigation products, we will help 
uh, grow the agri-food industry, expand primary agriculture production, and support a diversified value-added processing industry by enabling irrigation districts to manage their water allocation more efficiently. Another change that this bill will make is making board member term limits. Some irrigation districts, Mr. Speaker, have asked Alberta's government to enable them to set limits on the number of consecutive terms board members can serve. This is a common practice on many uh, boards. It will also help ensure irrigation district boards are adaptive, innovative, and positioned for the future. But other, other districts have expressed that they do not want to have set limits on consecutive terms as they value the experience, uh, the experience rather, of long-serving members. This amendment will give irrigation districts the option to set limits on the number of consecutive terms of its board members. As irrigation districts are a vital part of our economy, I believe that ensuring that their boards are filled with the most capable and innovative members is key to keeping this industry thriving. I know that irrigation districts will make the correct choices that have the balance of experience, innovation, and adaptation. Excuse me. They'll also be able, able to position irrigation in a positive way and will set them up to be successful in the future. Irrigation districts are very important to our economy and to our agriculture sector. I am proud to have so many ir vital irrigation districts right in my constituency of Cardston, Siksika. This includes Western, the Bow River, Lethbridge, Northern, McGrath, uh, United, Mountain View, Levitt, Etna, and Raymond irrigation districts. This accounts for over 1.2 million of the total license volume of seven different water sources. Irrigation districts not only provide jobs in the area, but also ensure that our agriculture industry in Southern Alberta continues to thrive. I know that this legislation will be very beneficial to my riding of Cardston Siksika and solve many of the concerns that irrigation districts have heard, have had. I'm thankful to the Minister of Agriculture for bringing up this very important piece of legislation to the Assembly. These much needed changes will ensure that our irrigation districts and irrigation industry will thrive now and in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Members. 29-2A is available. Seeing none, are there any members looking to join debate? I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton. McClung has risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to uh, rise to speak to Bill 54, the Irrigation District's Amendment Act 2021, on a, a topic and issue that uh, I've learned a fair bit about uh, during my past uh, tenure as the uh, critic for, uh, for agriculture and had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, meetings, uh, annual general meetings of the uh, Alberta Irrigation District Association and uh, uh, listened to some of their concerns. And of course, uh, one of the things that would always come up is the continued support of the provincial government for uh, ongoing programs that uh, allowed the uh, uh, <coughs> irrigation districts to um, continue uh, improving their network of uh, underground uh, pipeline systems versus the open canal systems of water transmission that has been the historical norm. And uh, while uh, general support from our side of the House will be found for this piece of legislation, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, there are some concerns about the, the couple of the elements, the basic tenets of the, uh, the legislation. Of course, one uh, uh, is the increase of the borrowing ability or capacity of the uh, irrigation districts and uh, this responsibility of course is something they've been asking for which is fine but what I hope not to see as a result in the future Mr. Speaker is a uh, move by the government to erode their current levels of support for programs such as the uh, 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 annual monies that go towards the uh, conversion of open water canals to underground pipelines, which of course do a, a lot to uh, increase the efficiency of water use and not, uh, not so much as loss to evaporation. But by giving 
the irrigation districts this increased borrowing capacity to accommodate their ability to, to uh, take advantage of the, the loan monies under the federal government offering. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, it doesn't uh, absolve the province of its responsibility to continue funding these infrastructure projects on an annual basis and that the province doesn't and this government doesn't see fit as a result to say, all right, you've got this borrowing capacity. It's up to you. You borrow the money yourself and, and, and you pay for it over time. We're, we're removing ourselves from that responsibility. So that's a bit of a fear that I have. And I'm, I'm going to be watching for that. I'm sure the Alberta Irrig Irrigation District Association will be very much uh, having a keen eye on that as well. Um, because it's, it's, it's a topic that uh, it, it raises a concern. So I, I'll be certainly watching for that. But uh, nonetheless, I know that the Alberta Irrigation District Association and others in the province who are involved in, in irrigation farming certainly uh, welcome the, this ability to borrow uh, larger amounts and take advantage of this uh, program offered through the federal government in conjunction with the province. So in principle, yes, indeed, support will be found on, on this side of the house. And uh, also for the term limits uh, uh, issue as well, uh, I think the, uh, uh, probably the right balance has been struck in that the uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, irrigation districts that uh, wish to maintain term limits can do so, and those that wish to in implement them have that choice as well. So it does give that flexibility. And for this, I think uh, it was a, a wise move to uh, give that choice to uh, the irrigation districts as to whether they implemented term limits or not according to their own uh, wishes at the local level. Now, one of the things that I uh, uh, had to say though also revolves around what <clears throat> isn't in this piece of legislation. It uh, is a, uh, an act that's brought forward to amend the Irrigation Districts Act at a time when we are critically looking at uh, supply chains and uh, agricultural production uh, globally right now during a, a pandemic period. And one of the concerns, of course, is that uh, uh, people globally are looking at uh, shrinking their supply chain and, and looking to grow more products locally. And that goes for those individual countries who uh, look to import Canadian products and Canadian agricultural products. And I know that we, as a country, Canada, send inspectors globally to, uh, to inspect plants and operations and agricultural production uh, right throughout the world to ensure that those products meet the standards that we expect in terms of uh, health and safety uh, for importation into, into Canada. And that's, of course, the goal that we have in Alberta and in Canada is to make sure that the reciprocating inspections that are done by countries we want to export to are also uh, up to snuff so that we, we do not threaten in any way uh, by our lack of adherence to uniform standards uh, our export uh, uh, capacities or ability to export into certain markets. The reason I bring this up, uh, Mr. Speaker, is because uh, while it's important to uh, involve the uh, uh, the federal government and in conjunction with the provincial government in, in bringing this larger piece of financing to the irrigation districts and enable them to, uh, to take advantage of it by increasing their, their borrowing abilities, uh, there's much more that could be done to ensure that uh, in this particular moment in, in history, our irrigation districts are enabled to uh, take full advantage on an ongoing basis of the global opportunities that we have rather than going backwards. Now, uh, one of the things that's been done in the ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture, of course, is that staffing levels have dropped as a result of cuts to the, the uh, uh, ministry, and that has affected the uh, inspection and uh, testing of water. And it may be left to the uh, individual irrigation districts or uh, to the, uh, the uh, to industry itself to perform the water testing and uh, get the, the results needed that will verify the quality of water for those who we wish to export to. 
And this is this integrity of this whole process, Mr. Speaker, is something that I would have hoped that this piece of legislation would have addressed uh, on top of the, the two major issues that it, it tackles. Because it's, it's critically important to Mr. Speaker that uh, uh, anyone we wish to export to has absolute faith in the quality of the water that is used in our agricultural production in our irrigated districts in the province. And I say this from a background of some experience within the uh, food processing industry and also in uh, the real estate industry where water testing and testing uh, was done uh, on a regular basis. And the absolute uniformity and the standardization and, and the integrity of those tests uh, has to be maintained. Uh, for example, in the, in the, in the meat packing plant where I used to work, there were, there were standards that had to be maintained and the test quality had to be done properly and there were ways it had to be done and the, the inspector was there to ensure it happened in that particular way. And with the changes that uh, uh, we don't see to the Act guaranteeing that the, the testing procedures are going to be uh, uh, properly monitored by a, a government agency, which no longer exists because of lack of, of funding, uh, is something that perhaps risks uh, the, the integrity in the minds of those uh, people we like to export to of our, our water quality. On top of that, never mind the, 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 the ongoing need to provide uh, absolute clear uh, quality testing and, and absolute faith in the whole process, is of course the, the threats that we have of, uh, of uh, new uh, coal mines being opened up in the eastern slopes, bringing into disrepute the possibility of, a, of disrepute of our, our water quality for irrigated districts. And we're pretty concerned about that. And I know that the irrigation districts themselves are very, very concerned about the integrity of the, the water supply as a result of, uh, of uh, future coal mining ex exploration and, uh, and development that may take place in our, our eastern slopes. So that is something that this piece of legislation doesn't, in my view, uh, uh, adequately address. It certainly uh, looks to tackle a couple of issues that the uh, uh, irrigation districts would uh, like to see, and that we, we agree with those. But there is such an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, here to have uh, made much greater strides to reflect exactly what threats are faced by our irrigation farmers and the whole irrigation industry in, in this province. Uh, it's something that we look to expand with this, uh, this new funding, absolutely, and perhaps even to a greater extent. But it's increasingly becoming a, a larger industry and it's something that deserves to be protected in a, in a larger light. And it, 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 you know, 200,000 additional acres is, is, is certainly welcome. But our, if our ex people, the countries who we're exporting to, are taking a look at our process and saying, well, we don't know if this <coughs> water testing process exactly has the integrity it needs, uh, if we, we don't know for sure what impact the, the selenium pollution will, might, will have from co for future coal mining, we won't, we won't have an export market, Mr. Speaker. So it's all well and good to provide uh, dollars and, and funding uh, borrowing capacity to expand the irrigation districts and to uh, do some housekeeping legislation which allows them to increase the term limits if they so wish or to maintain the term limits of, of uh, their, the, board, the board of directors of each irrigation district. But <clears throat> overarching that is the requirement to actually have the export market that we so rely on in the irrigation districts. So another example I can mention, uh, Mr. Speaker, is with respect to the, the process, because you know, we, we don't know for sure how the, the testing will take place to, to test the quality of the water samples, whose responsibility it will be. And I know in my duties as a, as a real estate agent, when you had acreage or, or agricultural properties that you were uh, selling, of course, well water and quality of the, that well water uh, was something that uh, had to be ascertained before you could sell it. So, of course, any buyer is interested in, in whether you got good water or quality water, potable, healthy water or not. And the testing you could get from a provincial office, the, the test bottles and so forth, and they had instructions on them. 
And uh, for the ill-informed, they would possibly just take a sample from the tap, which is, you know, you're drinking from the tap, but it, that is a potentially contaminated source. The actual source of the water had to come from uh, an uncontaminated location uh, right from the source of the well before it went into a, a reservoir or a tank or through the housing system of, of the internal pipes because that, that would allow it to be potentially contaminated. So my point being that it's incredibly important how this process for water testing and sampling actually works and it is stipulated and with the lack of, uh, of uniformity that may result from not having provincial uh, uh, oversight and provincial uh, testers go out and actually take these samples, we may be putting ourselves at risk of having uh, export people that we export to claiming that our, our, our uh, processes are, are, are not inviolate. They, they have to be absolutely uh, uh, subject to the scrutiny uh, and pass the muster of those, those markets that we wish to export to. We're talking about billions of dollars worth of, uh, of exports, Mr. Speaker, and we're talking about increasing our, uh, our agricultural irrigated areas by 200,000 acres to serve those export markets, but you have to be doggone sure, uh, Mr. Speaker, that those people who are reporting back to their respective governments uh, are making a report that says, yes, indeed, this uh, water that the irrigation districts are receiving is absolutely pristine, it's not affected by selenium from coal deposits. It's not contaminated. The processes that they use to test it and collect it and, and, and actually put it through the, the organic and multiple tests it has to go through to satisfy those export uh, markets are, are beyond repute. And uh, that's the concern I've got. I mean, it, this, we, we, we tinkered a little bit to... Uh, identify a couple of specific issues that uh, the irrigation districts hope to solve, yet we've, we've really done a, a, a drive-by without any consideration of the, the wider topics that the whole irrigation uh, agricultural sector in Alberta has looming in, in front of it that uh, really demand a much greater level of attention that, than this bill actually uh, addresses. And, uh, you know, it, it was a missed opportunity, I think, Mr. Speaker, to, uh, to do that. And I'm disappointed. Perhaps the minister will follow up with a much more wide-ranging uh, piece of legislation that uh, uh, takes into account <coughs> the realities of today. We're in a, a supply chain examination globally, and uh, individual exporters such as ourselves who rely upon our agricultural exports to to uh, sustain our industry we, we, we certainly produce way more than we, we we eat ourselves thank you honorable members 29 2a is available see none are there any members looking to join debate see none i am prepared to i see the i will just I see the Honourable Member for Brooks Medicine Hat has risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Edmonton Millwoods for being so kind as I um, was battling a technical difficulty that could result in me owing money to a charity, and I would be happy to do so because that was rude on my behalf, and I really do appreciate her kindness in, uh, in allowing me to speak today. Um, as members of the government caucus know, and maybe even members of the members opposite know, I am very passionate about a couple of things, and one of those things is irrigation. So um, being the member from Brooks Medicine Hat, I have the privilege of um, representing one of the largest irrigation districts in the province, um, namely the Eastern Irrigation District. Um, in Brooks Medicine Hat, we have a lot going for us. We're, we're really industrial. Um, part of the province where we have the ability to grow food um, unlike any other. We have the high, some of the highest heat units in the country, which for those who are not familiar with uh, agriculture means that we can produce very um, expensive crops quite easily, and that wouldn't be possible without the work of irrigation and without the, the innovations that irrigation has provided to our riding and to our country. So... Um, Mr. Speaker, there's, there's a book, and it's called Tapping the Bow. Um, it was one of the very first things that I was given 
um, upon entering public office. I was gifted this book by actually two different constituents um, who saw that this was a good idea for me to, to read into this book. Um, the book uh, might not sound like a page turner to, to everyone, but it certainly is interesting in that it outlines the history of irrigation in our province. Um, a very wise man in this chamber once told me that um, whiskey is for drinking, but water is for fighting. And um, that certainly is the truth. And that meant that for anybody who's wondering, that member is the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Transportation. That's a, it's one of his most famous quotes, I think, in our caucus. So um, we, we know that we need to make sure that water is protected in this province. We also know that we need to make, we need to acknowledge the resource that water truly is as the demands for, for water increase across the world. Um, we, the, Tapping the Bow is a book that outlines um, the formation of the Bow River Irrigation District, which I don't represent actually, but um, it is one of the largest irrigation projects in North America. Um, and it turned the Palliser Triangle, um, which is in the south, from an arid wasteland into over 600,000 hectares of prime farmland. Um, so Alberta has some of the most bountiful um, agricultural production because of irrigation projects like this and it's because of um, tapping the bow, so to speak, and because of irrigation projects like um, the Palliser Triangle that um, irrigation, such, irrigation districts such as the EID and others can exist today. So Bill 54, um, in case you guys were ever having irrigation district trivia, now you can participate. But um, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act um, allows Southern Alberta to continue to be part of Canada's vital breadbasket. We know that, um, and I've noticed them a lot, even in larger cities, that um, there are a lot of bumper stickers all over that say, if you ate today, thank a farmer. Um, we know that around the world, there's been, um, especially in India right now, or in Punjab, there's been, um, there's been a conversation around um, the essential nature of farmers, and that are, without farmers, there are no food, and the, truth, the same can be said in Alberta. Um, we know that um, irrigation contributes $3.6 billion to the GDP of our province every year. Um, so for perspective, that is 20% of agri-foods um, on only 4.7% of Alberta's farmland. So a great investment for anybody who's um, looking to move forward on that it obviously would be irrigation. Um, we know that the, uh, the ingenuity that is required to irrigate such an arid landscape is truly a marvel and um, the ability of these districts to, moder these districts to modernize their infrastructure um, is essential moving forward. So um, just as we ran as a government on um, jobs, the economy and pipelines, one thing that we can do, um, it doesn't have to be oil in the pipeline, you can also have a water pipeline. And um, the, the ability of irrigation districts to go from having open culverts Two pipelines will help us to increase our efficiency and use less water to do more work. So um, we know that pipelines, uh, these water pipelines will decrease the rate of evaporation, which is obviously important, and reduce overall water consumption from our headwaters, something that's very important for environmental conservation, as well as for costs on, on our farmlands uh, and our farmers. So um, when we're talking about water, it's important to, to talk about um, the, the way that farmers acquire water on their land, and that's through having water rights. Um, and we know that the old saying is first in line, first in right. That's how water rights are allocated throughout the province. Um, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act, Bill 54, does absolutely nothing to change those things. So I've heard concerns from the members opposite about um, how coal leasing would impact that. Um, but the, they would know, and we know, that the South Saskatchewan River Basin is, being, is close to new water licenses. Um, and the only opportunity for growth is doing more with existing allocations, so which is exactly what this bill allows them to do by um, converting these culverts and reducing evaporation to create um, uh, pipelines for, for water to flow through to be more efficient. So um, last year, I was very happy to be in Calgary at the um, Stampede Grounds in the Big Four to announce uh, the, or to be with the minister as he announced 
the $815 million deal in conjunction with the Canada Infrastructure Bank. $815 million is a, I can say for, for myself, is a, is a sum of money that I would never in a million years be able to fathom just how much money that really is. And I think the average Albertan doesn't have, you know, $815 million in their back pocket. So for us, for me, it's, it's just a very large sum of money to, to, to think about. And uh, for banks, they, they know that this is a large sum of money. They know how important it is to have certainty in their investment. And we know that in business, certainty is a very important thing. So um, this deal with, with those funds that are being allocated through provincial, federal governments, as well as the Canada Infrastructure Bank, are contingent upon certainty that these projects will be built and that that investment is going to um, yield good returns and, of course, um, be, uh, go towards investing in infrastructure for these communities. Now, the, um, the, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act um, rightfully removes the, the rivers of red tape, for lack of a better word, pun intended, um, when it comes to finding a way to ensure that um, irrigation districts are set up for, the, for success. So um, the purpose of a district is defined in the Act in four ways, and that is to convey and deliver water through the irrigation works of the district, to divert and use quantities of water under the terms and conditions of its license, to construct, operate, and maintain irrigation works, and to maintain and promote the econo economic viability of the district. So the current Act also refers to commercial activity, but that is very broadly defined. Um, the, the problem is that the CIB may even apply this broad definition to joint funding. So if a lending institution, Mr. Speaker, was deemed, um, a proposed project was deemed commercial activity, um, they might be hesitant to lend money without greater oversight by their members. Um, so that's why we're providing that, um, that, that oversight and as well as that clarity around what commercial activity is so that banks and other lending institutions um, wouldn't have to, to, to wade through the waters of red tape, so to speak. So um, even if the projects might be in the best interest of the district, this uncertainty that's created by the Act um, without these amendments um, could, be, could be a very, a very sad end. So um, for right now, a bank may actually require the SMRID, so the St. Mary's River Irrigation District, which is one that I represent, as well as the Eastern Irrigation District, to have a referendum of its own membership to fund infrastructure renewal if the project is large enough. Um, and I, I think, Mr. Speaker, that our farmers work hard enough. Um, our irrigators, they work hard enough, as well as, um, as, well as our irrigation districts. They, they go through a lot of work. They already wade through enough red tape as it is. Um, they don't need to do more um, to access money earmarked for these projects that's already been allowed. So um, Bill 54 is a step towards commitment to slash red tape in this province by at least a third and keep Alberta innovative and in the forefront of the industry. So uh, I believe that with amending the Irrigation Districts Act, we are doing our jobs as legislators representing Albertans and supporting their needs. And I will be voting in favor of Bill 54, obviously, Mr. Speaker, because um, as a representative of one of the largest irrigators, irrigation districts in the province, um, I'm very, very pleased to, say, to see this innovation coming forward as well as to be able to provide that, that for my constituents. So just some fun facts about irrigation. Um, not that I haven't provided you guys with enough answers for trivia questions for years to come, but we'll, go, we'll keep going. Um, there's a, it, it, with this investment um, from the Canada Infrastructure Bank, the provincial and federal government, over 6,800 direct and indirect permanent jobs and 1,200 construction jobs are expected to be created from, from that. Um, that's, that's this direct commitment to jobs, the economy, and pipelines. Like I said, this, maybe this isn't an oil pipeline, but this is certainly a pipeline that we can all get behind. And um, that it's a direct commitment from our government to say promise made and promise kept. Um, I know that I've heard a lot about this bill in my constituency, as um, many in my constituency are irrigators, and um, it was something that was brought up time and time again. I know the a member for, I believe it was a member for Edmonton Manning, brought up um, invasive species as well, and certainly that is, a, that is another issue. It, it was, the, yes, it was a member for Edmonton Manning, um, brought up invasive species as well as being another issue coming up, and that, of course, um, wouldn't be something that would likely be under the administrative portions of the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act, but would probably be something with environment and parks. Um, I know that in my first couple months being elected, I had met with the Minister of Environment and Parks um, to discuss invasive species because actually this was something that even came up during my nomination um, and how important it is to protect these waterways because we know that um, something like a zebra mussel um, can be incredibly contagious um, and incredibly... 
um, damaging to our canals if, they, if it were to get in. Um, the, the, the effects, we, we, you can't even understate how horrible that would be if they were to get into our waterways. So um, I, I agree, and I'm glad to see that this is a point that actually the opposition and the government can agree upon, that we know we really, really need to be protecting our water, and water is so integral um, in every place in Alberta, but especially in southern Alberta, where it is hotter than heck, and um, there isn't a whole heck of a lot of rain. So any kind of water that we have, we have to be finding ways to store it and use it efficiently. So, um, Mr. Speaker, I will close in saying that I am elated to be able to support Bill 54. I'm excited to be able to talk about irrigation, and the best part is I know there's Committee of the Whole and Third Reading coming up, so I'll hopefully be able to speak to it again. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me the opportunity today, and um, I'll resign my time. Thank you, Honourable Member. 29 a is available. Should anyone wish to make quick comments or questions? See none. Are there any members wishing to join debate? I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Beverly Clareview, has risen. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise and speak to uh, Bill 54, the Irrigation Districts Amendment Act. Um, I have a number of comments um, that will likely sound familiar uh, to some of the comments that my colleagues have made. Um, I do uh, agree and recognize uh, that uh, water is, is absolutely critical uh, and looking at opportunities to enhance um, access to water in southern Alberta uh, to support our uh, farmers, our ranchers, our agricultural sector um, is significant. In fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, we know uh, that uh, our agricultural sector uh, is the, uh, the second largest um, sector and driver of Alberta's GDP. Um, and it's absolutely critical. And we have uh, a number of incredible success stories in, uh, in southern Alberta. And so, you know, knowing uh, that this government has uh, committed a significant amount of money uh, in addition uh, or in this uh, bill, uh, in their uh, $800 million irrigation announcement, uh, but also in some of the changes uh, that they're making, um, is, uh, is a positive step forward, Mr. Speaker. Of course, you recall that under the previous government, uh, there was a number of infrastructure investments that we made in southern Alberta around the city of Lethbridge that, of course, attracted uh, some of the, in fact, the largest investment that Cavendish has ever made uh, in one moment in time uh, came because of um, a really a, a, a whole-of-government approach, uh, Mr. Speaker, that, that didn't just support Cavendish. Uh, we were very, very um, careful to ensure that uh, by providing some, some infrastructure investments and supports uh, for the region that it would mean attracting uh, new developments and investments into the region. Cavendish was one of those, um, one of those investments. But we know that we have, um, you know, some of the, uh, some of the best uh, agricultural lands in our province. Uh, you know, I'll argue that they, uh, those lands are scattered throughout the province. Uh, but we know that southern Alberta faces certain challenges uh, that much of the other parts of the province uh, don't have to face. And of course, water is, uh, is absolutely uh, critical. And so, uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, I, I will be uh, supporting uh, this bill. I think there is significant opportunity for Alberta to expand the investments when it comes to uh, food processing, uh, increasing agri-value uh, is absolutely critical, Mr. Speaker. I know uh, under our time in government, uh, this was a priority of ours. We made some critical investments, uh, like expanding the Leduc Food Processing Incubator, the largest in the world, uh, which of course has some incredible uh, success stories. One that I always enjoyed talking about, and still do, is a, a company called Cywin Foods. Uh, that uh, was a tenant in the Duke Food Processing Incubator. They graduated from that, set up uh, and built a brand new facility um, and, uh, and are in the process of, uh, or at least they were a couple of years ago, uh, not only producing some of the uh, best dumplings uh, made out of, outside of China, uh, but of course we're in the process of producing these dumplings to then sell back into China, which is quite fascinating. Uh, when you think about that. Uh, but again, you know, uh, an example of a successful company that needed some support uh, from the government of Alberta, which again, on this side of the house, 
uh, we believe that there is a role for government, Mr. Speaker. Uh, sometimes it's a small role, sometimes it's a larger role. Uh, this uh, investment in, uh, in irrigation is a great example of, uh, of a larger role that government uh, can play and should play in order to, uh, to be able to attract these kind of, uh, you know, investments. Uh, so I think there's significant opportunity to increase it. We know that Alberta um, and Canada have a, a very, very strong brand and reputation in the international community. Um, especially uh, in many countries that know that we have pristine air, water, and land, and uh, and want to uh, to make investments. In fact, um, you know, one could argue, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, that our products uh, from Alberta are in high demand all over the uh, all over the world, and so. Uh, Making these kind of investments uh, will attract um, broader investments, of course, create jobs for Albertans, um, and ensure that, uh, that there is prosperity to come. Now, one of the issues that was raised by a couple of my colleagues, you know, is the fact that uh, the, uh, one of the irrigation issues that, uh, that is not being addressed and that we would like to see addressed is uh, water monitoring. Now, currently, Mr. Speaker, the irrigation districts have to pay for that uh, themselves. Uh, but there's, there's a concern, and this is a legitimate concern. Um, and, you know, I, I appreciate that uh, debate on this bill so far has been quite respectful. Uh, but the fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is that any changes to coal uh, policies um, will have a, a direct impact um, on, uh, on our water. And we know that water is, uh, you know, can be very easily argued as the most important resource uh, that we have uh, to sustain life. And so, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is the 2021 budget for water monitoring out of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry was cut. And so the districts are asking, well, who, who, who's going to be accountable to ensure that proper water monitoring uh, is happening? And, and this is a very legitimate concern, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I know uh, from previous trade missions I participated on that, um, that ensuring that we are monitoring our water to guarantee uh, a, an extremely high standard will directly impact whether or not investment comes to this province. And if there is a shadow of a doubt that there either is a, a blip or a lack of monitoring or that there is a challenge with uh, or a potential risk to the quality of our water, um, international investment will flee. Um, or at least it will not come here. And, and we can't take that chance, Mr. Speaker, because it is absolutely critical. We're talking about uh, Alberta's reputation and uh, we're talking about uh, the livelihood of thousands of Albertans. Um, and so uh, who, who produce products, um, agricultural products, for millions of people worldwide. And so, uh, you know, I think that it's a legitimate question. My hope is that the government will address that um, in the uh, in Committee of the Whole. Um, and so uh, we'll just earmark that as one of the, uh, one of the, the issues that has, is not being addressed uh, at the moment. Um, now, there are some uh, additional changes to, uh, to the bill, or, or there were additional changes proposed by some of the irrigation districts that have not, um, that are not reflected in this bill. Now, we know that, again, the government has an opportunity not only to respond, but also an opportunity uh, to bring forward amendments, and, and our hope by, by flagging this and amplifying the voices of the irrigation districts uh, that, uh, that the government will address these issues. One is, uh, is around uh, planning and notification of construction uh, so that uh, folks can, can make plans um, not only with their, with their uh, agribusinesses but also with their lives uh, knowing uh, what and when uh, changes construction are going to be happening in their communities. Um, another one is uh, 
we're curious, and I know colleagues of mine have asked why only eight of the 13 irrigation canals are registered. Now, maybe it's because only eight of the 12 either responded to a survey or showed interest. I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker. It'd be great for the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry to be able to confirm uh, why four of the districts are not included. Again, it could just be that they chose not to. Um, it could be that... Uh, well, I won't speculate as to the reasons, but it'd be great to know uh, why that is. Uh, you know, a question that was raised by my colleague, uh, Member for Edmonton Manning, regarding Northern Alberta. Um, and I know that uh, we have different climates, different uh, landscapes throughout the province, which impacts um, agriculture and, and farming, uh, you know, throughout the province and differently, but, uh, but I am curious um, to know if, you know, there was any um, plans in northern Alberta where we have uh, sections uh, of agricultural land that, that has the opposite problem of too much water. Um, how, how is this government planning to support uh, farmers in northern Alberta uh, who, you know, quite rightly would argue that they are equally as important uh, as farmers in southern Alberta. Uh, so, curious to hear if, uh, if and what uh, supports are being uh, prepared or thought of or, or programs that are being debated uh, for northern Alberta. Um, you know, another question that was asked is just, you know, uh, recognizing that the government has indicated uh, that there are some shovel-ready projects, uh, I think it's fair to ask what those projects may be. Uh, we know that uh, agriculture uh, is important. The government has alluded to some sector strategies, of course. Uh, those are still very ambiguous. Um, ambiguous in the sense, Mr. Speaker, that even during estimates, a number of questions have been asked from a number of different ministers regarding sector strategies, uh, to which, unfortunately, there's been very little detail. Uh, detail as far as what those strategies might be, what are the programs, who's, uh, who's going to be eligible for them, uh, and what are the dollar investments that are going to be attached with it. Um, and so uh, I think those are also uh, legitimate, uh, legitimate questions, uh, Mr. Speaker. And so uh, I did want to just raise some of those, uh, some of those uh, concerns. I think it's important that the government uh, continues to work with other orders of government to secure funding. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very clear how uh, our provincial UCP government feel about the federal government. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to try to uh, attract as much federal investment back into our province. And so, uh, you know, some of the tactics that, uh, that our provincial government have used over the past couple of years has probably not helped uh, in the fight to get dollars back into Alberta. We know that there's a number of examples of other programs where money was left on the table. Um, and quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, that's a shame. It's a shame because, uh, you know, on the one hand, the government will talk about all of the money that uh, goes from Alberta to Ottawa through equalization, yet when there are opportunities to recoup or to get federal dollars reinvested back into our province, uh, there are significant dollar amounts, hundreds of millions of dollars that are not um, being taken off the table and invested back into Alberta. And that's a real concern, uh, Mr. Speaker, because uh, quite frankly, uh, we need, uh, Albertans work hard for their money, uh, they pay their taxes, and, uh, and they should be getting uh, dollars reinvested back into their communities. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't agree with, uh, you know, the, the tactics of, uh, of trying to play partisanship or leaving money on the table in order to point fingers. I think Albertans want to see results. They want to see outcomes. And they want to see, uh, you know, the, the government uh, make good on its promises. And so, uh, you know, I won't go too far down the path of, uh, of some of the programs uh, that have not been producing the outcomes that the government committed. Uh, but in, uh, in this bill, uh, we do see that, uh, that the federal government uh, did come to the table uh, to, uh, to provide some support. And so uh, I will encourage uh, this UCP government to work with the federal government where, uh, where possible. Uh, 
Um, I do find it fascinating, Mr. Speaker, that in the course of the last two hours, I've heard more cell phones and computers go off um, than I have ever heard standing in this chamber. And I have yet to see any members make a, a, a commitment to donate uh, to a charity. You did. Okay. <laughs> then uh, for the member from Brooks Medicine Hat, is that correct? Brooks Medicine Hat, I, I apologize uh, for that <laughs> comment. Uh, that she did, in fact, make uh, a commitment for a charitable donation. Uh, thank you, member. I think we're still short uh, a few other members in the chamber. Uh, having said that, Mr. Speaker, uh, I will be in support of, uh, of this bill and hope that uh, the debate can continue and that we can get uh, some questions to our answers that Albertans are asking us and we're asking on behalf of them. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. 29-2A is available. Seeing none, are there any members wishing to join debate? I am prepared to ask the question. I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton Meadows has risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise in the House on behalf of my constituents and uh, add my comments to the Bill 54, Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021. The more of that, looking at the time limit, I was planning to speak actually um, more in detail in third reading, but uh, I could not really actually uh, control my excitement really to add even my limited comments onto this bill. So as my colleagues uh, already have actually uh, demonstrated their support in favor of this bill uh, due to some of the importance, uh, important points uh, that's being addressed specifically uh, given the amount of uh, the money, the investment that's coming, that's, uh, you know, exciting. And given specifically, um, you know, the, the role of the agriculture sector in Alberta to, uh, you know, the general economy, I would say, in the province and uh, adding its value to the GDP and having the uh, actual, you know, uh, uh, the strength and the size of the industry given like 1.7 million irrigated acres involved in the province. The irrigation industry itself uh, generates about $2.4 billion in annual labor income and support about 50,000 jobs. Irrigation-related agriculture processing generates about $2 billion in total annual sales and accounts for about 18% of total provincial food processing sales, that's, that's quite a bit. The irrigation industry contributes up to 3.6 billion annually to Alberta's gross domestic product, GDP. Which represent about 20% of the agri-food sector GDP on only, that's I think something to be noted only 4.7% of the province's cultivated land base. So this is, uh, there's a lot to say. Uh, I would not probably spend my whole 15 minutes today in the, in the second reading. So I'm happy to support this bill as stating this is uh, this, the good step towards the right direction but this issue related to the agriculture really needs a comprehensive, you know, approach, consultations, dialogues, and the comprehensive policy framework by looking at what's happening around the globe, 
specifically the the crisis uh, the economy has demonstrated after um, over year long um, COVID-19 pandemic. I just wanted to bring this uh, this information for the record that the countries like India with a population over 1 billion people their GDP in the past due to a number of reasons and one of that probably the COVID-19 pandemic the GDP reached below zero, negative. When the country such like in that strength with lots of minerals and number of resources uh, that the country was known for, the only one sector that added to the GDP was the agriculture. Not that the agriculture, you know, showed growth in the GDP, but it's also, you know, important to look at this. Uh, I will just bring up a um, little, you know, conversation that I was having in my family back a few weeks, a few months. I usually, you know, discuss the topics with my um, um, recently graduated kids because they are struggling to find jobs. They graduated last year and there was no hope in technology sector to find a jobs in, in, in the situation uh, right now in the province. And they are also, you know, very, um, how would I say, intelligent people, especially the young generation, they are looking for the solution for the crisis they are facing today. And my kids were talking all about the, the, the growing sector in technology, even big companies called Apple, Facebook and, you know, renewables, the Microsoft, like the companies are already reaching on, on top and reaching their limits. And they were talking like, it hasn't probably left much of growth for the big corporates. And now for a number of other companies, if they wanted to stay and, and hold their status, they might have to look into some different avenues. One of those is the agriculture. And, and speaking that truth, the, the member from uh, Madison, uh, Brooks Madison had actually mentioned the, the issue in, uh, among Indian farmers right now. That is the, that will show actually um, uh, the actual challenge in the crisis and the contribution and the importance of the agriculture um, that the big corporates who has grown into energy, who has grown into technology, they are really actually looking for their potential so where they can grow and they're working very hard to get into the agriculture and that is the very clash between the farmers and the corporate sectors right now in India. And the Spain actually had, um, I would probably try to bring in depth and detailed information into the third reading uh, of this Bill 54. The Spain has legislated the, uh, the minimum, uh, minimum sale price for the crops or the produce in Spain, in France is struggling with the same challenge, and German is also initiating the dialogue around this. And what I wanted to say, you know, for me, what was surprising 
and something to learn. Even when we moved we, from India to the one of the developed places like such Alberta and Canada, so we, we seem to, you know, just assume that everything has been, you know, dealt and addressed with so, you know, professional manners. But looking at this bell, that Alberta has so many challenges to grow through. So this is important. Very first step I wanted to support that if we are looking for independent economy, the self-serving economy, the agriculture sector can play the incredibly important role. So we need to support that. I also wanted to highlight it's not just a political blame game. It is also the, uh, the contradiction in government approach. And then simultaneously, we are debating Bill 54. On the other hand, the government is, you know, having conducting the online survey on coal mining, specifically on category one and two land. So water protection is another hand is being really compromised. So this is something I really wanted to actually put onto the record and wanted to, um, wanted to bring the information to the house. Um, at this point of time and I will look forward to bring more information um, in during the third reading uh, on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member. 29-2A is available for any questions or comments. Seeing none, are there any members wishing to join debate? Question. Seeing none, I am prepared to ask the question. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture and Forestry has moved second reading of Bill 54, Irrig Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021. Does the Assembly agree to the motion for second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. That is carried. Bill 54, Irrigation Districts Amendment Act 2021 is now read a second time. Under government bills and orders for second reading, Bill 55, College of Alberta School Superintendents Act, adjourn debate, Mr. Fian. Thank you. Are there any members wishing to join debate on, I believe, the individual who caught my eye was the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Beverly Clareview? Sure, <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I can't even repeat that on answer. Um, but uh, a very witty comment from, uh, from the front bench. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's my pleasure to rise and speak to Bill 55, College of Alberta Super School Superintendents Act. Um, you know, I think, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, there's, there's uh, only a few changes in this bill, and so I don't think I will uh, take up all of my time, but I did want to just comment on it while we're in uh, uh, second reading. Uh, and just to begin, Mr. Speaker, by, I guess, outlining the fact that uh, education is, is absolutely critical. Um, and for many years, in fact, uh, since I've begun my time in, uh, in this chamber, uh, I've talked about uh, Alberta's greatest resource, uh, and uh, I know that there's uh, been some differing opinions on that, but uh, I truly believe, Mr. Speaker, that, uh, that people are our greatest resource, and uh, investing in education is, uh, is absolutely critical uh, to, uh, to ensure that, uh, that Alberta will continue to be uh, a, a global leader, that will continue to... Uh, to offer uh, the highest quality of life uh, for our citizens. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, Mr. Speaker, this bill is, is talking about uh, superintendents uh, specifically. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that uh, myself and my colleagues, uh, as I'd imagine uh, colleagues on the other side of the chamber as well, uh, have been hearing from Alberta students and staff and parents um, over the number of, of changes that are occurring simultaneously, recognizing, Mr. Speaker, that this bill doesn't deal uh, with, uh, with curriculum. This is about uh, superintendents, but of course, as you'll know, Mr. Speaker, that uh, our superintendents uh, are put in place to oversee uh, school uh, divisions, and, uh, and that, of course, impacts uh, 
the education that uh, that our students are receiving. Um, you know, Mr. Speaker, one of the things that that we are hearing from uh, our students, uh, again, staff uh, at schools, families, uh, is that uh, they're calling. Uh, for a number of things. One of the things that they're calling for, Mr. Speaker, is to ensure that um, every year we have an average of 20,000 new students entering uh, the school system, that there will, in fact, uh, be adequate supports, uh, meaning adequate uh, resources. So we have teachers to teach our students, that we uh, work toward reducing class sizes, um, knowing the impact that uh, the quality of education has on students and and mr speaker i've heard uh at different times during education debates in this chamber um members trying to make an argument that the uh the quality of, of education and teaching uh does not go up or down depending on the number of students in a classroom mr speaker i can tell you from experience uh, i am a teacher uh, i taught uh, high school for a number of years and I can tell you that having fewer students means that uh, I and teachers have more time with each student individually, which increases uh, the quality of education. And even when I look at, you know, at my educational career, um, when I went to post-secondary, Mr. Speaker, I started off at Concordia University College. Uh, did that by choice because it's a smaller academic school, meaning smaller classrooms. Uh, students are able to get to know their professors better um, on a, a first-name basis, which I believe um, set me off uh, on, uh, on the right foot uh, to continue my, my educational career. Yes, I graduated from the U of A and very proud of that. Uh, but uh, when we talk about quality of education, um, you know, class size is, uh, is one of the factors. We also know that, uh, that our schools need adequate support. Uh, that, uh, you know, teachers have uh, an increasing diverse group of students that they are teaching with a variety of different needs and backgrounds, and uh, those students uh, and teachers need to be supported if we want our kids to receive the highest quality of education. Now, Mr. Speaker, you'll know that Alberta in the past um, had been a global leader when it comes to uh, to our curriculum, when it comes to uh, our students. In fact, Mr. Speaker, when I was on a number of trade missions uh, in, uh, in Asia, in fact, on one mission in China, it was the first class to graduate using the Alberta curriculum. So these were students that came in in kindergarten uh, using the, the Alberta curriculum and they were graduating. Um, and how proud they were, um, and we were, that our curriculum is used, or at least was, uh, by a number of different countries around the world. Th that's now being questioned, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and I'm sure that there are jurisdictions that are looking at some of the proposed changes uh, with concern uh, and uh, not sure if they're going to continue. In fact, we know the Northwest Territories um, has had agreements with Alberta to use our curriculum and has used our curriculum for decades. Um, and uh, it was tabled in this chamber that, uh, that they are uncertain if they're going to continue that agreement. Uh, and we know that in part uh, that's because of, of the changes that are being proposed in this new curriculum. Um, now, again, Mr. Speaker, here uh, we're talking about um, this piece of legislation dealing with superintendents. Um, and so, uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, what, uh, what one of the issues uh, or questions that I do have for the government that I hope that they will uh, respond to uh, with this legislation is the uncertainty that currently exists uh, with respect to principals and vice principals who directly work in schools and whether or not, Mr. Speaker, uh, they'll be subject to the new college. Um, now... They need this certainty. I can tell you from speaking uh, to a number of, uh, of principals uh, and, and uh, those uh, that are leaders within our education system, uh, they've made it really clear that, uh, you know, in this bill that it's critical that CAS, or the new College of Superintendents, uh, that this bill is proposing to create coming um, uh, 
into effect or being the regulator starting in September of 2022, but that CAS is made up of peers, of educators. It's not going to be made up of, of, of um, administrators uh, who are not educators, who don't uh, understand um, the realities, the challenges, um, and the, um, you know, the importance of, uh, or the ins and outs of the role. They may recognize the importance of it, uh, but that it, it needs to be made up of, uh, of peers. Um, and so, again, you know, when we look at, at this bill, uh, we're in the process of reaching out uh, to superintendents um, and, uh, and other school trustees, et cetera, to, uh, to get their opinion. Uh, as you know, Mr. Speaker, this is second reading, and so we do have a little bit of time uh, with this piece of legislation to ensure that we uh, engage in a robust debate uh, with stakeholders. I appreciate the government may stand up and say, yes, we've consulted with, uh, with folks uh, far and wide, uh, but uh, I think the official opposition would like to verify that uh, with stakeholders directly. Um, other uh, changes to this bill, maybe I should have started with that, Mr. Speaker. So uh, within this legislation, uh, the government's estimating that roughly 1,300 managers will become regulated members. Uh, the minister will no longer approve superintendent contracts with school boards, uh, and that a, a CAST disciplinary committee would determine uh, if there was allegations of a serious misconduct, uh, but that can only be recommended to the minister, um, and that uh, at that point it's the minister's decision what consequences may uh, arise from that. Um, now, it, uh, what this bill does do is, is continue, uh, when it comes to pay for superintendents, that that would uh, continue to follow the grid that was developed uh, under our government. Um, and so, uh, because of that, the college does not assume any uh, collective bargaining type functions. Uh, so, uh, again, you know, providing a, a, an update uh, to this bill and creating a, a well, an update to the position of superintendent by creating a professional college for educational superintendents and deputy superintendents employed in the public separate and francophone school authorities um, is, uh, it seems, uh, at the, the first reading, or I guess we're in second reading, but the first uh, view of this bill that it makes sense. Again, I'm always curious to know um, if it was in fact superintendents asking for these changes, um, you know, who's, uh, who's, who's asking for the changes, what is the, uh, the challenge or the problem that we are trying to address or correct uh, through this legislation. Um, as well, uh, Mr. Speaker, the college will be responsible for professional development um, and setting learning requirements for its members, um, I believe, Actually, you know what, Mr. Speaker, I don't know who, uh, who is doing that for superintendents uh, before this piece of legislation moved forward. Now, maybe this is a way uh, to bring it all into one house, into one department. Um, if there is a cost savings uh, to this, I'm very curious to know what that would be and what that would look like. Um, and really just for, for the government to get into the nuts and bolts uh, behind, uh, behind this uh, proposed piece of, of legislation. Like I said, Mr. Speaker, um, for, uh, for me, I think it's critical that principals and vice principals um, who are working in schools remain part of the ATA. I can tell you that there are examples in other jurisdictions where principals and vice principals have become uh, part of management, separate from uh, teachers, uh, and that has had uh, some negative consequences for the culture uh, that goes on at the school that uh, principals are themselves first and foremost teachers. And so, um, you know, depending on uh, which studies you look at, Mr. Speaker, some have asserted that what this does is drives a wedge between principals and teachers. Uh, I think it, it, it creates an unnecessary uh, additional uh, hierarchical structure uh, where again, you know, principals, vice principals are, are first and foremost teachers and in fact, during this COVID pandemic, every principal that I've talked to has done more teaching in the past year covering for teachers going off on isolation uh, than they have for many, many years. Uh, 
Uh, now, I know uh, talking to a number of principals, uh, there's a number of them that are personal friends of mine that miss the art of teaching uh, when they get into that role of being the top administrator for a school. Uh, but nonetheless, Mr. Speaker, um, it, is, it is important uh, that they remain a, a colleague uh, with, uh, with their other teachers in the school. And so uh, we will be advocating strongly that, uh, that they remain a part of the ATA um, and, uh, and that this preserves the uh, integrity, the collegial relationship that exists. Obviously, teachers know that they report uh, to principals um, unnecessary uh, divisions or additional uh, hierarchical structures I don't think are necessary. And in fact, if you look at the private sector, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, as a bit of a comparison, more and more companies are looking at uh, more flat models as opposed to layers and layers of, of hierarchy um, because they're, they're realizing uh, very quickly that... Uh, that creating unnecessary, um, you know, divisions and layers uh, does not necessarily uh, bring forward uh, greater productivity. Um, and in fact, um, you know, there are a number of, of, of companies that look at that. Now that's comparing companies to, uh, to our schools. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we would like to see that clarification in, in black and white in this bill. Um, and uh, like I said, Mr. Speaker, the other, uh, the other point that I think is absolutely critical is that uh, this new College of Alberta Superintendents is made up of peers and not uh, either appointees or hand-picked folks uh, who aren't uh, educators, who don't have that background, that knowledge, uh, that experience that will, um, that's critical to, uh, to this job. And so uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I uh, will take my seat. And uh, like I had said at the onset, I uh, will be supporting this bill in second reading and then we'll uh, continue to engage with stakeholders and hopefully get some more uh, detailed information from this government and, uh, and continue this, uh, this debate. With that, I will take my seat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, Standing Order 29-2A is available. If anyone has a brief question or comment for the Member for Edmonton Beverly Clareview. Seeing none, the Honourable Member for Spruce Grove Stony Plain. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was actually hoping my new uh, hairstyle would uh, allow you to see me a little bit, uh, you know, quicker, but apparently the Member from Beverly Clareview um, caught your eye a little bit before me, so... But I'm honoured to, to stand here today and offer my support for Bill 55, the College of Alberta School Superintendents Act. And I'd like to thank the Minister of Education for all the hard work she put into this bill and the consultations that have helped make this bill possible. Now, as many in this house know by now, I'm a father of two boys, and like any parent in the province, a strong and high-quality education system is extremely important to me. And that's why I'm happy to support Bill 55 as I believe it will improve the quality of our education system, which in turn will benefit students and school boards because of the increased accountability that this bill aims to achieve. Bill 55, the College of Alberta School Superintendents Act, will provide additional accountability to Alberta's education system by making the college a legislative professional regulatory body. By enacting this legislation, the College of Alberta School Superintendents will now be responsible for the conduct and competency of its regulatory members. This will include superintendents and deputy superintendents in the public, Catholic, or Francophone school districts. I would like to thank the College of Alberta School Superintendents for submitting this proposal to the Minister of Education late 2019 and for engaging in the significant consultations that occurred last year, which I will talk about later on. Superintendents play an integral part and role in how our school systems operate and the quality of education that our children receive. The guidance and direction that they provide to other education leaders also improves the quality of our educational system. And these educational leaders should be held to the highest standard that is consistent across the entire province. Now at the moment, the College of Alberta School Superintendents is voluntary and has about 320 members. Bill 55 would require that all superintendents, deputy superintendents, and some other school leaders employed by public, separate, and francophony school boards to be a member of the college. By requiring mandatory membership for all superintendents and deputy superintendents and other educational le leaders, 
A set of standards will be created that will raise the bar of excellence and quality within Alberta's education. And, and like how there's a set of standards for our fantastic teachers, many of my friends and family uh, are teachers, uh, but including many of those in Spruce Grove and Stony Plain, there will now be a set of standards for our superintendents and deputy superintendents. This bill will also establish a non-regulated membership that isn't mandatory and provide the college with the bylaw making power to establish categories of membership for non-regulated members. These non-regulated members could also include system leaders and First Nations school authorities and independent schools who wish to join and contribute within the professional community of practice. Retired superintendents and university professors may also join as non-regulated members. Now having a non-regulated membership for those who are not a superintendent or deputy superintendent is important because they will be able or they will be a part in the professional community and be able to contribute while not being subjected to disciplinary process. Alberta's education system will be strengthened by this professional organization and students from kindergarten to grade 12 will benefit. A disciplinary process within any organization is important to the credibility and quality of the organization. And while I'm sure that nearly every superintendent conducts themselves professionally, this legislation will ensure professional conduct and will instill a process that allows for a fair investigation and resolution if a complaint is made. Now even though the disciplinary process will now be overseen by the College of Alberta School Superintendents, if this bill is passed, it is important to note that the college will still have to report into the Minister of Education and is required to provide the Minister with recommendations on if a certificate of practice should be suspended or cancelled. I want to clarify something before I go any further. This legislation does not give more power to the superintendent over the school board. The school board must still be respected as the employer of the superintendent or deputy superintendent and that is explicitly mentioned within this legislation. It's also important to mention that the college will not be able to act as a union and will be able to engage in collective bargaining or assist in negotiating employment contracts. I'm also happy to say that there are no additional costs associated with the proposed changes of this bill and that this bill will not come into effect until September 2022, which gives plenty of time to smooth, smoothly transition to these changes. The College of Alberta School Superintendents is expected to be self-sustaining through membership fees. Now, last summer there were extensive consultations and an online survey that was distributed to superintendents and deputy superintendents, assistant and associate superintendents, directors and other central office staff. And I'd like to thank all the stakeholders that were involved in consultations, including the Alberta Teachers Association, the Alberta School Boards Association, the Association of Alberta Public Charter Schools, the Association of Independent Schools and Colleges of Alberta, the Association of School Business Officials of Alberta, and First Nations superintendents and educational directors. I'm happy to see that most of the feedback received after the consultations were positive, and I know that our government, and especially the Minister of Education, appreciates the input given by the Alberta Teachers Association. This legislation does not affect the rules within the Teaching Profession Act, but instead incorporates the College of Alberta School Superintendents into the broader education system, which includes the Alberta Teaching Association. Mr. Speaker, Bill 55 is a great act that improves Alberta's education system for the betterment of our kids. And I'm proud of the terrific work that our superintendents do every day in providing top-notch educational leadership. And I know that this bill will positively affect the leadership of our educational leaders. And that is why I urge everyone in this house to support this act, which will benefit our students and kids for years to come. Thank you. Honourable members, standing order 292A is available. If anyone has a brief question or comment for the member. Seeing none, are there others wishing to join the debate? The honourable member for Edmonton, Castle Down. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's my ple pleasure to rise this afternoon to speak to Bill 55, College of Alberta School Superintendents Act. Um, I would like to start uh, by acknowledging the incredible frontline workers that are working day daily uh, to support Albertans uh, through this pandemic. That's something that I've started as a practice here to do um, an acknowledgement of our support and gratitude. Um, and when we're, we're talking about a pandemic and this piece of legislation, um, our students and our teachers and our families have been incredibly impacted. Um, and I could even go as far as to say is disrupted somewhat in their learning uh, because of the pandemic. 
Some incredible decisions have been made by, by parents, whether or not to have their child attend in person, whether or not to have their child attend in, online. Um, I have a, a student, a child, who's a student in grade 12, who has struggled with those decisions, um, not feeling safe in school, but also not feeling supported with mental health um, by not being in school. So just knowing the importance of all of those working in the pandemic, trying to make our children's lives as normal uh, as possible, I just need to give a huge shout out to all of the incredible staff and volunteers that are working in our school system across the province to help support our children during this really difficult learning time. Uh, so today we're debating the College of Alberta School Superintendents Act and I know today uh, my colleague from Edmonton Glenora proposed a emergency debate to discuss the curriculum. Um, unfortunately, it was prevented by government uh, to have that debate and I think while we're talking about superintendents and we're talking about schools, um, it begs a question to why this minister is proposing a piece of legislation under her ministry that addresses superintendents and creating a college as opposed to what Albertans are asking for. Uh, which is support for schools, uh, a modern curriculum. Um, so we put forward a proposal to discuss this, to debate this on an emergency basis in the chamber this afternoon, and that wasn't, um, it wasn't seen as being important. Now, today, outside in this uh, parking lot, um, myself and one of my colleagues was approached by a young person uh, who just randomly expressed concern about the curriculum and specifically cited that grade two students are going to be expected to uh, understand, discuss uh, the silk trade. And this was a conversation that was unprovoked. Um, this is something that we know Albertans are talking about. We have been inundated over this uh, last few days since the curriculum changes were released with concerns from Indigenous leaders, from students, staff, families, grandparents. Uh, and so while we're in this chamber with the, the incredible privilege to debate legislation, this government has the ability to introduce legislation that I think is very, should be relevant and timely. Um, when Albertans are asking to talk about the curriculum and all of their concerns, um, why instead we're discussing Alberta school superintendents and the introduction of more bureaucracy, really, in our, in our education system instead of focusing on what Albertans want to talk about, which is this curriculum that has been introduced that many are saying uh, is damaging to our students. It's damaging to our, our young learners uh, in the province. And I can speak to the fact that when... When people talk to me about education in the province, uh, whether they're a grandparent, whether they're an educator, whether they're a volunteer that works in the lunch program at a school, t students, uh, educators, they, they don't talk to me about building a new college for superintendent. Not right now. That's something that isn't really top of mind. If you're, if you're talking to Albertans right now, the pandemic, is top of mind and the risk that our students are in because they didn't have the, the proper supports going back to school. Um, but they're also now really concerned about the curriculum that's being proposed. And I think that there's multiple levels when it comes to the concerns about the curriculum. Um, we're putting our Alberta students at a disadvantage when it comes to learning across the entire country. Um, I can speak to a military family's experience when they're being posted to Alberta or being posted from Alberta to another province. One of the things that parents have top of mind concern is how their child will integrate into their next school year in their new province. And so when we're talking about a college of Alberta school um, superintendents, I just... I, I don't think that that's something that families that are considering 
their child's education is talking about. They want to make sure that their child that's going from perhaps grade 9 to grade 10 uh, has a really good grasp of their learning. And when we look at other provinces learning a modern curriculum, and Alberta proposing the curriculum that they are with so many concerns about appropriateness uh, just for the age level, um, that's a concern. So I know that it's not just the military that move across the province with their children. Uh, there's many families that tend to relocate. Uh, they look at other job opportunities and one of their main concerns is their children's education. And we live in a country where each province gets to decide the education for their, for their young people. And for whatever reason, this, this government is deciding to roll back our education system and put forward a learning that just, it just doesn't make sense. And why this minister of education is deciding to bring forward legislation that creates more bureaucracy in a college instead of actually addressing what Albertans are asking for is very concerning. Um, we know that Albertans are calling on funding to make sure that the 20,000 uh, new students entering the classroom will actually have teachers. That's a concern. Uh, making sure that their students are, are being properly educated in accurate history. Um, we look at the concerns around the culture component of the curriculum. And it's just, it's very confusing to me as to why we're talking about introducing a college when there's so many other things that Albertans are asking for when it comes to our education system. Now, myself, as um, having been part of the Alberta College of Social Workers, I understand the importance of a professional body that governs itself. Um, and I, I think that the, the member from uh, Beverly Clairview made a very good point that he had heard from, from educators or those involved in the education system that when we're looking at setting up a college that it needs to be made up of peers. Um, peers that really understand what the Alberta school system is. Having this understanding that if there is unfortunately a disciplinary action that needs to occur, that those that are tasked with reviewing that disciplinary action really understand the whole picture. So making sure that those that are represented in the college are from the uh, education system, um, I think that's a, a really, really fair point. I think that when consultation is happening that those are things that make sense when we're looking at creating a college. Um, I know that there's risk of doing appointee uh, positions and the risk is that those that are in charge of running the college don't have a or at risk of not having a, a clear understanding of what the work is, what the environment of the education system is. And so I think that that's something that we would like to hear if that's going to be part of this creation of a professional college. Um, the other piece is, when I look at the college uh, that I belong to as a social worker, um, a big piece of that was the ethics component. And so when working in an ethical environment, um, I, I'm curious how this government is going to create the code of ethics for, for this college um, and what they see as the criteria for those ethics. Um, because we've seen some questionable behavior from, from this government um, that I would argue and, and many have said to me is somewhat unethical. We've seen behaviors from ministers, from this premier, uh, that border on that. And so I'm curious who's going to be responsible for the creation of the ethics that govern this college of uh, superintendents. I know when it comes to learning in this province, uh, there's been little emphasis put on, on the actual learning component for our young people, our future of this province. We saw this government introduce a piece of legislation that had early learning 
in the title of the bill and then was never mentioned at all throughout the entire bill, uh, which tells me and Albertans that early learning isn't something that is important. And so when we have a minister bringing forward legislation that doesn't seem to be timed, uh, when there's so many other things that she should be addressing, um, like I've mentioned, uh, developing a modern curriculum for Albertans, or funding the desperately needed supports for students with complex needs. I know that as a social worker, I relied heavily on linking families up with PUF funding, and this is a government that cut that funding. And so that speaks to where they see the importance of early learning. Um, and complex needs are something that our students desperately need. Our, our teachers and our support staff have been asking for, for more supports for that. Um, and that isn't something that's being addressed in, in this bill or in this session. Um, instead, we're talking about the introduction of a college for Alberta Social or sorry, Alberta School of Superintendents. So there's just so many pieces that the education system currently under this government is failing. And why this piece of legislation was brought forward now is baffling to me. Um, we've seen unprecedented amounts of outcry from Albertans with concern over curriculum. And that's people that have told me that they support the UCP government. They do not support this curriculum for their children. They, they don't believe that this is a, a decision that is actually in the best interest of our, of our future. Our, our future in terms of how they learn, um, what they're learning. We know from teachers that there's an ability to teach and have the children uh, actually retain it. In a, in a way that they can recall it rather than simply memorizing it. And this, this curriculum is, is getting away from what we know is effective learning strategies and teaching strategies and trying to look at simply retention. Now, I know as a kid, when I was a student, um, there was times definitely where I needed to memorize something for, for that moment. Um, but the classes that had the most impact on me is when the teachers made a memorable experience in the learning. Um, I had an incredible teacher in junior high that took learning to a whole new level. She would stand on her desk to teach a concept. And there's things that we talked about in that moment that I remember now. Sometimes I can't remember what I, I ate for breakfast, um, but I can recall very clearly some of those those learning that I had experienced in, in junior high because of that teacher. And so when we change the curriculum to a way of learning that we know is proven isn't effective, what are we doing to our children? We're not setting up future learners to accelerate in, in the workforce, to accelerate in post-secondary. Uh, we have a huge risk to, to, our, to our young people and I think that the fact that we're in the legislature today debating creating a college instead of really talking about what Albertans are talking about is concerning. Now, I'm not saying that the creation of a college is a bad thing. Um, I just don't see how this can be what the ministers identified as a priority when there are so many things that need to be addressed uh, first, that Albertans are asking to be addressed first. They want to know that their children have adequate supports in their schools. And with that, I will close my comments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, Standing Order 29-2A is available if anyone has a brief question or comment for the member for Edmonton Castle Downs. Seeing none, Calgary East is risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to speak uh, to Bill 55, the College of Alberta School Superintendent Act, which was proposed by the Honourable Minister of Education. First of all, I would like to thank the Minister for putting together a bill that will benefit both school boards and students throughout the province. Today, Mr. Speaker, I am here to show my support for Bill 55. As a parent, I understand how important the education system is in Alberta and believe that Bill 
Bill 55 will help further improve it. This is an extremely important piece of legislation as our youth are the ones who shape the future. This legislation will greatly improve our education system, giving each and every student a chance to succeed. Mr. Speaker, the College of Alberta School Superintendents, or CAS, currently has 320 members. This includes superintendents from 61 public, separate, and francophone school authorities, which make up nearly 60% of First Nations school authorities, as well as 11 of 13 charter school authorities. Currently, CASS is a voluntary organization. Though the, though the new proposal will require memberships for superintendents, dep deputy superintendents, and some school system leaders employed by a public, separate, and francophone school board. CASS will also establish classes for non-mandatory membership. Mr. Speaker, these changes will increase efficiency and accountability within our education system. This act will help create an extremely professional organization for school system leaders who in turn will strengthen education from kindergarten through grade 12 for all students. Superintendents play a cru crucial role in making sure our students receive high quality education as to parents, teachers, and trustees who are all part of the same system. This act will hold education system leaders accountable, which is something that Alberta parents and students both want and deserve. We believe that superintendents play a vital role in our students receiving top education, quality education, and this act makes that clear. One thing that is important to note to Albertan is that CASS will not be involved in any contract negotiations. They will also not play a union function for superintendents, which is something we want to be made very clear. Mr. Speaker, last year, members of our government spoke to our education partners about ways we can improve how our education leaders are governed. We realized as a result of this, the changes needed to be made in order to help build an education system that is full of professional leaders that will provide even better outcomes for students throughout Alberta. This act has been well thought out. During the summer of 2020, the Department of Education discuss this proposal with CASS. This discussion included online survey for the superintendents, deputy superintendents, assistant superintendents, directors, and other central office staff, as well as face-to-face -face meeting, meeting with CASS and many other affected stakeholder groups. Mr. Speaker, after all this research was completed, it was concluded that the, that the vast majority of those consulted thought it was beneficial to both themselves and the education system of CASS to become our legislated organizations. Mr. Speaker, the amount of positive feedback we have gotten in this regard is the reason I believe this is such a great act. This will have significantly positive impact on our students moving forward. If this act is passed, CASS will become a regulated professional organization which will strengthen the leadership of schools at the highest level. This will ensure that both students and school system be supported through improved accountability and leadership excellence moving forward. In order to ensure CASS is keeping up to standards, they will be submitting an annual report to the legislature. The annual reports will ensure that both appropriate oversight and public accountability is in place. 
This way, we are able to make sure that the standards have been met and our students are receiving the, edu uh, the education they deserve. Mr. Speaker, if this bill does in fact get passed, the proclamation date of the act is scheduled for 2022. This gives time for the department to continue working with CASS as they focus on trans transitioning to a regulatory body and are able to continue discussing ways to improve the education system. Of course, with changes like this, many are wondering what the cost will be. We understand that given the current COVID-19 pandemic, along with the economic recession, finances are tough right now for many Albertans. Our government is pleased to report that there will be no new cost associated with this proposal. Along with that, CASS is accepted, expected to be self-sustaining through membership fees. This means that CASS will not require government funding through the transition period. Mr. Speaker, while the Act will enhance how the education system leaders are held accountable, we are making sure we will not place any unnecessary barriers or rules in place. While our goal is to make the education system better, we want to work with our school leaders. This government believes the changes being proposed are important to ensure the best oversight of our school leaders. Mr. Speaker, the mission to put the act in place began back in 2019 when CASS had first submitted a proposal to be recognized through legislation. I am very proud of our government for moving forward with this and for all the work they have done to make it possible. These types of changes we are proposing are nothing out of ordinary. In fact, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario also currently have professional organizations of teacher leaders ensure they're maintaining a high standard. It also helps them to ensure that these regulated members are both skilled, competent in their professional practice, which we need to make sure is the case here in Alberta as well. With these changes, we understand that some of our superintendents and other members may require professional development. CASS will be responsible for helping these particular members out, ensuring that they are 100% capable of giving our youth the best education possible. Another extremely important role CASS will have is overseeing professional discipline of its regulated members. While we hope it never happens, there is always a chance that somewhere down the line there are cases of unprofessional conduct. If there are any complaints filed, CASS will have the tools they need to deal with such complaints the best way they, fee, they see fit. In doing this, the structure will be very similar to that of other legislated structures in Alberta, especially the practice review of teachers and te teacher leaders regulation, both of which we believe the current system work very well for. Mr. Speaker, the Act is a crucial step in improving the education system in Alberta, and something I believe strongly in. I'm very proud of my colleagues for putting this traffic act together, and I'm extremely proud to be speaking on it today. CASS mission is to provide leadership, expertise, advocacy, to improve, promote, and champion student success. I think we can all agree that something that is extremely important for both our students and the future of the great province. My hope is that everyone will show support for this act as it will be very beneficial for the education sector. Our youth deserve the best, and this is going to give them just that, providing them all the tools they need to be successful. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, Standing Order 29-2A is available if anyone has a brief question or comment for the Member for Calgary East. 
Seeing none, are there others wishing to join in the debate? The Honorable Member for Edmonton Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure once again to rise in the House uh, to speak on the Bill 55, College of Alberta School Superintendents Act. Mr. Speaker, I wanted to start with my comments actually uh, recognizing uh, the teachers through you. Uh, Mr. Joe McKenzie, who's been teaching my son, son's class of CLS, um, up to until a uh, very difficult experience of the COVID-19 pandemic last year. So what had happened, the, the public health orders and the number of uh, the government decisions and the situations, safety measures, changes in the uh, school operations, moving the classes to online, so Mr. McKenzie uh, could not, you know, keep um, with up like his, his class after um, the fall 2020. So I also wanted to recognize and thank you through you uh, to Ms. Tara Harrington. She is taking the CLS class, my son's class actually right now, uh, substituting the, some of the work that was being done by Mr. Joe McKenzie. I actually did recognize her work, her challenges, uh, somewhere in the last session, but then I went back and spoke with her and wanted to get her consent that I can, you know, speak her name to the record. So the reason I wanted to recognize, I wanted to share a little experience around that. So Tara is teaching this CLS class online and handling uh, the children with disability with four different levels due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the challenges and changes to the school operations we have. So my son is in last year. She has a children's from grade nine, 10, 11, 12, and different level of their um, you know, uh, education gradings. With very little sport, the little sport I'm seeing because she still has access to the internet, she still has access to the computers. I don't exactly know what access, because I see that. Every time I have my son you know, joining the class, I don't find really a sport. That's where I, you know, it encouraged me to just get up, intervene, and speak with her. And on the other hand, I also wanted to um, recognize the parents specifically the parents of young child children and the parents of special need children, those students, they have so much difficulty actually um, operating the computers independently, understanding the topics. And I know number of parents right now staying homes not going to work 
and even those parents further impacts and challenges on them, the parents uh, from or within racialized communities, they also probably, you know, need lots of support in a number of ways um, to address a number of challenges to understanding the language, helping the students to learn, respond. And, and that was, you know, one of the challenge that I have, I have been witnessing uh, personally and that needed support from our government, the support for schools, the support for teachers, and the support for families. And that is where we exactly saw and we keep witnessing the government struggle to come up with strong mind and make a decision and help those individuals and help the school system. And we hear from our constituents every day over phones, via emails, and in person meetings with them maintaining the public health orders as much as possible. We try to um, coordinate with this. Interestingly, I just wanted to share the feedbacks even from 10 years old student. So what they're looking for, their priority and their concern what has happened in the past few years is classroom capacity. This was the reply and the feedback um, during my Zoom meeting with the class sixth grade. When I asked what feedbacks do you want me to take back, this is my job. And that was the question put by the grade sixter student that my, my classroom is more congested, my desks, our desks are being more squished into, and now we are too many of people, and sometimes we don't get turns to participate and speak on the topics we wanted to share. So this was kind of the feedback that we are hearing from our constituents when we are saying 20,000 more students and definitely the gov government needed to make sure that every new student coming to or joining the schools have the teachers, but that has been compromised. A number of times we speak on the bells and we have our own approach in different regions. And I try to reframe every time that it doesn't look like this is just, you know, oppositions, parties in debate, but there are common issues. I do not expect if you go back somewhere in Calgary school district and you will not get the same feedback around the classroom capacities, teachers, sports staffs that I'm receiving from my own constituency in Edmonton Meadows. And I have asked this question actually during the supplementary supply um, to the infrastructure minister, to the education minister, that we were surprised to see that the school that being announced for so long still doesn't have a 
very clear information in year 2021 that was announced and that was on the priority list in 2019. Not only that, and also one of the largest uh, school board district in the province. Didn't really see even single new school coming uh, from the budget 2021. So those are the challenges. Those are the questions they're being put forward. And that's kind of the advocacy that families, parents, students, teachers actually doing in the province. And that was something really needed to be taken seriously by this government. And that was something we would have been happy, more happier to discuss in the House. And that is something the opposition is always willing to help the government around these topics. And unfortunately, we are not seeing any progress um, towards these issues at all. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit around the CASS, as I have a number of questions actually regarding the school system. So we will support this in the second reading, the creating of a professional college for educational superintendents and deputy superintendents employed in public and separate or francophone school authorities. So something I was hearing um, the member from Calgary East, um, I would probably like to know more detail on it, that where the members who are going to become the regulators, 1,300 people, no, they'll be paying fee, this will be self-sustainable institution or the body that will be run by the membership fees, that was something really concerning to me. That what exactly uh, the government is trying to address by not focusing on some of the important issues and diverting the attentions towards this very bureaucratic issue within the school system that no one really, really actually demanded or advocated for it. And what are the funding models? Um, I don't know, as that's the question. The minister can really expand on it and how this will, you know, be able to hold their ongoing operations. And the other thing, how the, uh, the committee will be constituted. So is this bill, the committee bill be appointed by the government or that bill be elected by the members? If this committee will constitutes the, the expertise and uh, will make of the, you know, by the peers of uh, experts in the area. And the other question that I had in my mind was, so what is their role in the disciplinary matter where the committee can hold the investigation but would not have the authority to act on it. So these are some of the concerns uh, directly related to this bill that the ministry can really expand on it and provide details around it. And there have been incredibly 
important hot topics among Alberta publics. And I would really like to see the government focus on those. Uh, the, these comments, I would like to... Honourable members, standing order 29-2A is available. The Honourable Member for Edmonton McClung has risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Please to stand under 29-2A and uh, uh, comment uh, a little bit on the uh, remarks made by the uh, uh, previous speaker from our caucus. And I, I know that uh, this piece of legislation, the Bill 55 College of Alberta School Superintendents Act, attempts to respond to some who were calling for a change to the system where the Minister of Education brings in reforms allowing different reorganizations to take place within the school system and superintendent designations. However, what it doesn't do is deal with what 30,000 Albertans are telling us, and that is to pay attention to things that are really mattering to them, and what's really mattering to them, Mr. Speaker, are uh, the, uh, the, the, the severe deficiencies in the uh, proposed curriculum that the current Minister of Education is embroiled in right now, which has got the, the backs up of, of thousands of Albertans who are really in disbelief at the proposal that uh, is going to be taking us backwards in, at a time when we need to be preparing the students for the future in a, in a world that's changing rapidly. Yet, uh, what we look at now is a, 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 a curriculum that uh, is the, the, the taking all the time of the Minister of Education that uh, should be uh, focusing on the future. First, I hesitate to interrupt, but pursuant to Standing Order 8.4, the House stands adjourned until this evening at 7.30 p.m.